It's truly a joy to be here, and you'll hear a lot from Darlene tomorrow, and uh, she has a lot to share. Um, in fact, let me say on the front end, I don't know what you expected coming to a marriage weekend or the 17 reasons why you tried to convince yourself you weren't supposed to come. Usually when that happens, it looks something like this. Uh, we're too big of a mess. I'm too big, big of a mess. If, if, if anybody else in that room knew what a mess we were, they would give us the left foot of fellowship out of that church. We just assume that when you go to an event like this, um, everybody else has their act together more than you do. Let me say on the front end, for Darlene and I, our Couples Encouragement Weekend is all about richly encouraging all of you in terms of knowing that this is a weekend about encouragement and hope. How much hope can we cram in to a Friday night, a Saturday morning, and a Sunday morning? And I say that because, again, these 46 years have been rapture and rupture. These 46 years have been years of wondering who wants to trade the other in for a Diet Coke the first. Who, who, who can... Who can, who can answer this prayer? Oh, Lord, put two people out of their misery. Take one of us to heaven. Now, that may seem extreme to some of you. But the, the honest reality of, of, of marriage is that it's more than we ever bargained for. By God's design. And so who's welcome? Who's welcome to this event? Well, um, people from different experiences and faith stories. We don't assume that because you're here, we necessarily agree on all things theological. Now, it is going to be our commitment to seek to faithfully tell the story that the Bible's telling that focuses on Jesus with regard to marriage. Now, that, that's the, that's the on-ramp, but you need to know we don't assume we're all in the same place in our faith journey. Maybe some of us are just beginning to consider, is there a God? Maybe some of us are in seasons of life where we're very angry at God. Uh, maybe we're in this room tonight wondering if nothing happens this weekend, who files first? Now, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic. I'm trying to be as encouraging as possible. None of us in this room or beyond the need of the grace of God. And none of us in this room are beyond the reach of the grace of God. And, and I say that sincerely. That's not pastor speak. That's not hype. It's not spin. It truly is the hope of the gospel. If we could do only one thing in these three blocks of time, tonight, tomorrow morning, and Sunday morning, if there's only one thing that could be accomplished, it would be this. All of us, no matter who we are, come a little bit more fully alive to the only love that's better than life. The only love that will never let go of us. The only love that is enough to meet our longings, to take on our brokenness, and to free us to live with one more sinner saint until either Jesus comes back or one of us commits the other to the earth. That love is God's love for us. This will not be primarily a weekend about how to fix your spouse. It definitely will not be a setup to make you believe that if you had married the right person, you would be 10 times happier than you are right now. It will be God speaking to us in various ways through his word, by his grace, through Darlene and my brokenness and longings and encouragement, how Jesus has been meeting us, leading all of us to a little bit clearer understanding of what John the Apostle meant when he wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Consider how great the love is the Father has lavished upon us. That we, that we in this room should be called the children of God. And that is what we are and what we will be, we do not know. But we do know this, that when Jesus appears, we will see him as he is and we will be made like him. Let me say, that's what you want 
more than you want a changed spouse, whether you know it or not. That's what you long for far more than a happy marriage, to know God's lavish love for you. And the healthiest marriage on the face of the earth is simply a husband and a wife living in that story to God's glory, more fully coming alive to that love. And that's why right now we're going to start with the theme, as you see in your notes, of story. And the operative question tonight for us is this. What story is your marriage actually telling? Your marriage right now. If, if, if onlookers were to observe, what's the actual story your marriage is telling? Now, that's going to lead to an equally important, really even more important question, which is this. Who actually is authoring your marriage? Who is writing your marriage story? That's not the same question. Number one, what story is your marriage right now telling? But number two, what author is penning your marriage? Now, why do I go there? Let me tell you one of my one and only favorite Will Ferrell movies. That automatically kind of, you know, divides the room. You think, is, can anything good come out of Will Ferrell? But let me tell you, there was a marvelous movie that came out several years ago called Stranger Than Fiction. If you saw the movie, raise your hand. Got anybody? A few of you. All right. Let me, let me tell you the story and why it relates to where we're going tonight in God's Word. This is a marvelous story of Will Ferrell, who uh, is, is taking on a persona, persona and character like you've never seen him play before. He is a very bored and boring IRS agent whose life is absolutely routinized. He gets up every day, wears the same khaki pants every day, the same navy jacket every day, the same Weegians every day, brushes his teeth 37 times in the same direction, goes down to the corner to catch the same bus, stands on the same corner, and lives a very boring, routinized life. Well, as the movie begins, you're, you're not surprised to hear narration, right? You know, when you read a novel or when you hear a movie, someone's telling the story. And so there's this voice that's kind of introducing us to who this character is and how he lives his life. Well, all of a sudden, the brilliance of the filmmaker cuts to Will Farrow, and he turns around because the narrating voice that we're hearing, he's hearing. He's hearing a real voice. Someone's telling a story. And so this movie unfolds with Will Farrow trying to discover what is this voice that's telling me the next thing I'm going to do. So there's an author and play in his story. Well, here, here's the great thing about this movie. He discovers, honey, is it Richard Dreyfus? Is that who it is? There's an English professor, Dustin Hoffman. Like I said, Dustin Hoffman, Richard Dreyfus, an actor. Anyway, he discovers Dustin Hoffman is an English professor in, in a local university, and, and Dustin Hoffman helps Will Farrow recognize, oh, yes, this is such and such of an authoress, and she always kills the lead character. And so the movie unfolds, is this authoress going to write his story unto death, or will he, Will Farrell? Break free from the wrong story. Now, that's what's going on this weekend. That's what's going on right now. Some voice, some storyline, some narrator is writing your marriage story. Now, there could be conflicting stories going on in the marriage. Now, what does that look like? Look with your outline. I've just got a few classic historic motifs that many people that claim to be followers of Christ wittingly or unwittingly fall into a plot, a narration that really is not one authored by the Bible. In fact, let's just consider some of these right now. Just a theme right now. Hold, hold with that notion. What, what, if, what if you're living the wrong story and how would you know? Well, maybe someone is far more authoring your story and it's heading towards death and there's a hope that you could redirect that. All right, well, here's some terribly wrong uh, 
narrations for marriage that some of us have fallen into. Some of you would know that other not exactly great piece of cinematography, Jerry Maguire. But uh, some popular marriage narratives. Here's one, the Jerry Maguire narrative. And uh, in this movie, uh, Tom Cruise, actually we're going to get to the Bible in a minute away from movies, so don't worry, this isn't uh, Cinemax 101. But there's this opening line when Tom Cruise looks at his love interest and he says this, you complete me. And it seems to be so schmaltzy and manipulative from the get-go because here is someone in a relationship basically saying, if I can only have you, it will be enough. Again, a foolish marriage story, assuming, foolishly believing that there's one human spouse in the universe God designed to fill you up, or even as though God's design is to fill you up with a human spouse. Can I say it right now? If you were to have seven spouses of your dreams, they would not be enough to fill up the hole in your heart that is reserved for God himself. And again, I want that to be profound and not just, you know, a religious speak or something like that. We're going to talk more about that, what that means. You All of us are deeply longing for intimacy, made for connection. We're not wrong about that. But it's it's just wrong to think, you know, there's someone that's supposed to fill me up. Here's another one. Here's another popular story. The escaping my crazy family narrative. Entering marriage as a reaction, not as a calling. Leaving, but not cleaving and weaving. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we got married. You're here tomorrow morning. Darlene and I have a story that goes like this. We start dating, and on our second date, I ask her to marry me, and we're married three months later. That's called an unwise narrative, by the way, and uh, (laughs) God's been very gracious to break into our story, but as you'll hear tomorrow, we both came from significantly broken family systems and had a far better idea of what we did not want than what we wanted. And you know what? That's absolutely okay. As long as you begin to process, what was I thinking? What am I thinking now? You know, um, I was a stranger to my heart. Darlene was a stranger to her heart. We absolutely were strangers to each other's hearts. But more importantly, we knew so little of the loving heart of God for us in our mess. Well, some of us got married just to escape something. Here's another one. The Savior narrative. Marriage is a way of salvation and validation for you or for your spouse. So it can work in two directions. You know, if you uh, enter marriage to think, okay, finally this person is going to be my deliverance. Now, you're not thinking in spiritual or religious terms, but there's just some sense of I'm banking on this person and unwittingly so to be God in my life or for me to be God in their life. Psychological terms, sometimes that's called codependency. You just get hooked into a fashion in a very unhealthy way. And you either plug your umbilical cord into another human being or you grab theirs and plug it into you. Folks, the good news is this. If any of this sounds familiar, there's grace for all of it. There is God's grace for all of the brokenness that we live in and bring into our relationships. The old Christian subculture stereotype narrative, that's too many words, but here's what it looks like. I have a career and provide, that's the husband speaking, you cook, clean, and have, and raise babies. That's you, wife. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, you got problems with that one, Scotty? Thought you were a Christian. As we're going to see in a minute, when you really begin to study the design God intended for a husband and wife in the Garden of Eden, just begin to realize, you know, some of the assumptions we had about what it's supposed to look like, they really don't square with, uh, with God's design, per se. Here's two more, and then we're going to really move into the one that I pray will become precious and real for all of us. Here's another one. The corporate enterprise narrative. Marriage is 50-50. You do your part, and I'll do mine. If you offer 97%, I will. If you offer 41%, I can match your 41%. And this is seeing marriage more as a contract than a covenant. And again, it gets into this tit-for-tat correlation. And many times, you know, in marriage, we start off with a sense of naivete and putting our best 
foot and heart and hand forward. And then, you know, the, the law of diminishing returns begins to set in. You start thinking, well, if you're going to do that, I can do that too. We need to break these cycles. And there's grace for that. And here's one last one. And there's so many more. You, you might fill in the blank yourself to say, well, here's, here's what we know now. We did not know then about really what our expectations were. But here's one that we absolutely need to be delivered from by God's grace. The Pollyanna narrative. And they lived happily ever after. Confusing compatibility with marital cocaine. Mutual bliss. The assumption that this relationship primarily is about making me ecstatic and happy. Now, I'm so thankful that there are tiny little bits of truth, good longings that got sabotaged in all of these. See, my goal now is not for us and for Darlene and as I get very, as we get very personal with our story tomorrow, uh, it, it, it's not to be cynical about anything, but to begin to say, God's design, God's story is to be preferred over any other. Now, let me just take one more moment now to pray. And then this narrative painting that's in your notes is on the screen. I'm going to begin to walk through with you to help us understand. So what is the story that God has designed for his sons and daughters? Let me pray into that. Let me just take a moment to pray. Father, thank you for this marvelous room full of just invaluable, just glorious men and women made in your image. Just thank you, Lord, that truly there's freedom in this gathering to, to be very comfortable, to, to know your welcoming heart, to know, Lord, that... Um, there's no one here that's odd man or odd woman or odd couple out. Uh, this is your conversation with us, Lord. Uh, Darlene and I would just simply surrender to whatever would be encouraging and, and glorifying to you. Lord, I pray that uh, you protect those who are here tonight and tomorrow. <clears throat> and and the, the more that would be here Sunday from anything that we would uh, teach or share that just contradicts the wonders of your love and grace and truth. Be with us now, we pray, Father. Uh, free us, focus us. Thank you, Lord, that we're not in a hurry to finish a booklet. We're not in a hurry to say a bunch of stuff. We are in a hurry to meet with you. And we trust you, Father, to, 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 to give us an understanding a palpable taste of your great delight in us, your great enjoyment of us, your transforming, renewing grace and mercy for all of us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let me uh, get this unhooked here. I like to roam a little bit. I'm not going to roam far because tonight in particular, I want to focus more on um, this narrative painting, and you see some language. I've got four affirmations. Uh, as we begin to uh, look at a narrative painting <clears throat> that tells God's story. Very quickly, a little background about this painting. Um, uh, Mitchell mentioned uh, we had the privilege to plant a church in Franklin, Tennessee back in 1986 with five couples. And uh, just some very dear friends we'd been walking with in a marriage builder small group. I, at this time, was a pastor for a discipleship at Christ Presbyterian Church, and another church that we helped plant in 1981. We actually moved to Nashville from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where I was ordained at First Pres Winston-Salem. And uh, we moved to Nashville, and I was a youth pastor at First Pres Nashville, then in 1981, we started this one church, Christ Pres, and then in 86, they sent us to Franklin to plant this daughter church. Well, um, <clears throat> we were utterly naive about what it meant to plant a church and uh, uh, sent out with this good core group that began to grow pretty quickly. And, and here's kind of how I summarize that journey. Mitchell used this image because it gave it to him. God just graciously decided to drop a gospel bomb on Franklin, Tennessee, and we got to be the collateral damage. I mean, that church went from five couples to 4,000 people in eight years, and, and there's no gimmicks. There's no, tell me the 
church growth planting strategy that worked. No, God decided to take a bunch of legalist, pragmatist, arrogant, self-righteous, older brothers, people from completely pagan backgrounds, and really begin to teach them about his grace. And we simply got to be the ones written into that story. And that church grew, but it grew primarily by most of us coming from, you know, a clueless posture of what do we mean when we say God is a God of love? What do we mean when we say this word grace? Well, we were studying, and the more we studied the grace of God revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more that story got bigger and better. Oh, about, I guess, maybe 10 years in, one of the amazingly creative artists in our church, uh, a a, a fantastic visual painter named David Arms, A-R-M-S, has a fantastic studio outside of Franklin, and uh, it's loved by people from all kinds of different faith backgrounds and stories. Um, He was a member of our church, and I met with David in a Starbucks in Nashville, and I simply had four little trees on a napkin that I said to David, David, as we continue to grow as a church and as the Lord is telling us more uh, about how good he is and how big his story is, I'd love you to create a narrative painting that we would hang in our worship center that every time we gather, we would, we would have before us a summary of the story that God is telling from the first chapters of Genesis through the last chapters of the book of Revelation. The one unfolding big story that we as a church are discovering that God is telling. And so <clears throat> what you have before you, you can see it pretty good. Yeah, that's not bad rendering at all. You, you see four panels. Uh, They are sewn together. They are four trees on a definite horizon. You'll see that tree on the left, and then you see the tree immediately to its right, down on the horizon, the next tree up a little bit, and then the fourth tree higher on the horizon than any of the four. Now, that's very, very important to understand as we, again, the question tonight is, what is the story that God is telling throughout the Scripture and therefore the story he would tell in our marriages. Well, these four trees, again, clearly they are trees. The first tree and the last tree symbolize or summarize uh, what's known as the tree of life. And that would simply help us think about the first two chapters of the book of Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, where God created his world and where there's this, these summary images of, of life, the way God designed it. For his image bearers. Now we're going to camp out there in a few moments because it is so important. We we in this room need to understand. So what was the original design? How good is God? What what if the way God tells his story, he he contradicts all this other noise from all these other narratives that I've grown up with in church or had this piecemeal understanding? What if God actually is a lot better and different than what I even thought he was in the church I grew up in. We're going to talk about that. That first tree, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. The last tree, the tree of life as it will be in what the Bible calls the new heaven and new earth or the fullness of heaven. When Christ returns to complete his story, when he finishes making all things new, when he comes to to fully heal, fully free, fully redeem, what will life be like? We're going to talk about that as well. The two middle trees. That second tree on that panel, it's very ashen gray. Uh, If you could see the original painting, and it's about seven feet wide, three feet tall, you'd see those four labels at the base of each of the trees. That second label is loss, the tree of loss. We go from the tree of love to the tree of loss. And this is important to understand as the Bible narrates life, as God tells his story, he wants us to know basically this, cheer up, things are a lot worse than you think they are. In other words, this image is of, okay, here here is a panel that's meant to say, so what happened when sin and death invaded God's world? How does the Bible tell the story of, of how broken, broken really is? Well, what if you yourself are a lot more broken than you realize? What if your spouse is not just 
not just committed to robbing you of joy, but has a degree of brokenness that as God would meet you in yours, you might begin to understand theirs. And rather than contempt, compassion might enter in at the very vortex of where you guys are aching and hurting and longing. What if you're not actually two whiners living together, but uh, a man and a woman with deep longings written into your very DNA by the God of creation, the God of Eden, but those good longings have been tragically sabotaged. That's what that second panel is saying. There is nothing in God's world that's not broken. Hebrew language is more the language of disintegrated. In fact, the one word that describes a Garden of Eden in the Bible and really the life for which we were made and, and, the, and the echoes that are in your heart and my heart, the word shalom, the word peace summarizes that first panel that God made us. Well, look on your notes. I, I use this language. God has made us as we begin to understand his story for knowing, glorifying, and enjoying him. And in fact, let me just camp out there for a moment before I go through all four. And again, we're going we're gonna to go at the pace of grace this weekend. There's no determination to fill in all your notes. So we'll, we'll break at the right time when I see your eyes begin to roll back. We'll take that have you seen all that chocolate over there? We've got a serious uh, uh, carb-loading caffeine moment awaiting us in a few moments. So I'll, I will watch your eyes, and we'll take that. But hang with me, and let me talk to you a little bit more about this first panel before we go through the other three. So what were you made for? Again, the, the God of the Bible basically says, as he tells his story in Genesis 1 and 2, number one, he was never lonely. Um, he, he, he never in eternity thought, I'm so lonely, I need to create Scotty and Darlene. He could have done a lot better than that. The way God tells his story is that he exists as perfect relationship, passion, intimacy, intimacy, and delight. God, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, out of the sheer wisdom and the bounty of passion and creativity, creates a world and creates in that world a son and daughter. You know, the beginning of, of, of who we are, image bearers of God, made by God, like God, for God, to reveal God. Now, I didn't get that in the Sunday school I grew up in, in Graham, North Carolina. That's, that's where this redneck accent comes from, from a little town of 10,000 people between Greensboro, where Darlene's from, and Chapel Hill, where I went to my first, uh, where I went to undergraduate school at the University of North Carolina. If you're from Duke, it's okay, there's grace for that. Um, but, you know, when I look back on the rubrics of, so how did I even think about God early on growing up in church, child in the church and all that? And, and, and where, where did I miss this part of the fact that, that God is a generous, gracious God? He didn't start his story just with a big bunch of rules to keep, but, but, a, but a gift of himself to know. See, when you think of the the way the Garden of Eden is designed and the position of the tree of life and the provision of God for son and daughter. Just, just think about even how, what the language looks like, you know, a, a, along with being made by God, for God, uh, we're made for um, a, a life of uh, personal wholeness, every aspect of our being just connected. It works, our thinking, our feeling, our touching. We are, we are made uh, eminently as a, as a sensual people with senses to be engaged in God's world. I mean, you read Genesis 1 and 2, and it looks a lot more wild and creative and adventurous and fulfilling than a lot of us have usually thought about with respect to God in our lives. But I love this next one, and I could spend the rest of the night highlighting this because this might begin to key in on so Scotty, you're using a lot of big abstract categories. Bring it home. Can you notch it down a little bit for me? When you read Genesis 1 and 2 and you really begin to say, so what did God design? What was the original intent? My absolute favorite descriptor of God's story for us is in Genesis 2.25 when the scriptures say this, the man and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. Now, as a young Christian, and I became a Christ follower in high school in 1968, go 60s, 
You know, so, there's some good stuff about being aging boomers, honey. We did get to live through the 60s. We had great music. But, you know, in, in 1968, uh, as a young Christian, and I'm just completely clueless about the Bible, you begin to hear some verses. And the first time I ever heard that verse, the, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Number one, as a child of the 60s, I thought, oh, that's cool. They're, they don't have clothes on and the lights are on and nobody's ashamed. Well, it's not that that's a bad thought, but it has nothing to do with what's going on in that passage. What's being described, and please hear this. If you've got that much more bandwidth to hear anything tonight, hear this. What's being described in Genesis 2.25 is this. You and I were made to be most at home before the gaze of God with no need to pretend, pose, or hide. Let me say that again. This image of being made for shame-free nakedness is only secondarily what a husband and wife share in committed relationship of honoring their relationship and celebrating that. It is primarily to be before the gaze of God where we feel zero shame. Now, I don't know about you, but it's kind of hard to imagine life without shame, without a sense of brokenness, without a sense of embarrassment, without a sense of guilt, without a sense of something's wrong, right? Right? But just let that land on your heart for a minute. God made you, whether or not you ever have a human spouse, to be absolutely most alive before him. And if that's not happening, if it's not happening now, if it used to be a part of how you did life, but you just kind of either ran from it, forgot it, leaked it, chose a different story. I just want you to begin to risk believing that maybe that is a far more vital part of your design than either you've ever understood or it's been a long time since you've enjoyed. We are made to have no shame, which, you know, it's kind of sad that a negative has to be used to describe a positive, to say Shame-free is to say there was a time when there was no shame. Now, what is shame? What is shame? The essence of shame, good psychology tells us, is this. Shame is always connected to the eyes. It's always an issue of being seen. What does it feel like when you're being seen? Right? Okay, well, you know, you, you can think of various experiences in life, maybe in this day where you thought, I hope nobody was watching. Now, you don't need to raise your hand and say, let me tell you, I hope, they were, I hope nobody saw this. But just think through the normal processes of life, privacy, decency, embarrassment. But the, 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 the beautiful picture is this. God made you to know his absolute welcome, delight, and enjoyment. And he made you to enjoy sharing that in the human community in such a fashion that it's in relationship with this God that you move forward. Now, again, it, it, we're not required to be married to know that kind of, you know, freedom and healing and health, but it's always going to run through this incredible gift called grace that we might know it in this life because that second panel is true. Everything is broken. You know, our, our, our design is for this incredible connection with the living God, but because it got broken, Now the way we think, see, feel, touch, taste, what we do with our longings, it's gotten skewed. It's gotten bent. And uh, that second panel, again, I'm not going to use tonight to go through all the imagery of what the artist did. I will send to Mitchell a monograph I wrote explaining all the little symbols and all the paintings. I don't want to get lost in the weeds tonight because I want to move more fully into some of the pictures here that will begin to help us understand what, what... possibly might God by his grace be pleased to do in my heart and in this marriage moving forward. It really does begin to take us to that third panel. Look at the third panel for a moment and you see some two, two or three things that stand out. Maybe they're odd. You see this kind of new age looking egg hanging over the top of that third tree. You see some butterflies to the left. Well, um, the, the artist, David Arms, he did a great job of pondering you know, what story the Bible is telling with respect to what did God do about the brokenness? And what has God done, not just about the brokenness, but about the glory? Please understand, you were beautiful before you were broken. 
You have a dignity about you, and your spouse has a dignity about them that needs to be unlocked. And however, in view of the need, the distance, the disintegration in our hearts through sin and death, you know, uh, who we are, that third panel tells the story of here's what the Bible says, here's why we hope. Here's what hope actually looks like, and it's far, it's far more about a person than a second chance. The Bible is not telling any stories of second chances. We're not here to turn over, turn over a new leaf. We need to become a new tree. And see, that's the good news of when you begin to ponder in summary, what's going on in that third tree, that, that tree that now is labeled the tree of love? Well, that's not a white little cross painted on a, a tree, it's actually a, a summation of saying the Bible answers the question, so what has God done about the need, the longings, the pain? Uh, how, how dare I hope for me, for us? Well, that trajectory leads us to the person of Jesus himself. And so that third tree invites us to ponder who is Jesus? What has he actually accomplished by his life, death, and resurrection? Um, uh, what, what is his role in the life of restoration and healing? What place is he designed to take in this marriage? In fact, that, that automatically takes us back to the Garden of Eden. Think with me even for a moment in terms of the original story, the way God even designed the first marriage with respect to a husband and wife and always God. I mean, the great image of Eden is it was always assumed this marriage is going to be healthy, lived in a dynamic relationship with this God. Well, that's where in this third panel the gospel begins to become precious and clear to us and making connectors. These butterflies, they speak of the fact that as we know the Christ story, Jesus came into this world and he lived in our place and he died in our place and he was raised to newness of life, not just for his benefit, but for ours. That's why three butterflies, not one. Scriptures tell the story that everything Jesus he did, everything Jesus did, he did for you. And please, you know, again, the part of the problem for those of us that have grown up in church culture, um, we kind of assume these things and they begin to lose their wonder. They begin to lose their any sense of impact. And, 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 and a weekend like this gives us, gives us a chance to begin to say, Lord, where did my heart go? Where, 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 where did I go from having any sense of, of awe or astonishment about the way you designed and delight and love and take on? Where did that, where did that grow dim? And Lord, meet me, meet us even this Weekend. Well, that's what that third panel begins to invite us to ponder. What does it mean to be in relationship with Jesus in a marriage now, right now? Well, it, it means, as we'll see in these next, you know, this stretch of tonight and tomorrow, that, that the healthiest marriages that are based upon the Christian story would begin to understand. And Darlene and I use this language. We are more married to Jesus than we are to each other. Now, that may sound incredibly weird, like, what? What, what, do you, what do you mean by those words? Well, as we begin to understand the gospel, it's even with a view to that fourth panel. Now, look at that fourth panel, keeping all four before your gaze. It looks perhaps more strange than any. You've got this gigantic fruit going off the canvas. You've got the biggest tree of the four. It's highest on the horizon. That sky is true Carolina blue, thank you very much, because we know the sky of heaven will be Carolina blue. I'm just kidding you, please. I'm not going to be obnoxious with the Tar Heel stuff. But you see, uh, you see enormity, you see completion, and as we'll see, one of the great aspects of God's story for our marriage is we are not going to be living in our little condos together in heaven. Every human marriage is a temporary marriage. Now, I'm not trying to shock you, but actually to help you understand why marriage means so much. Remember some of those words that Jesus offered to his disciples to their even befuddlement 
when they're, you know, when one group of scribes tried to confuse him, stump the band, stump the Jesus. So Jesus, a man had, you know, seven different wives. So in the resurrection and the eternity, which one is he going to live with? To which Jesus so, said so wryly, none. You don't really understand the story, do you? In the resurrection, they, they are neither married nor given in marriage. Now, what is that supposed to mean? You know, if you're sitting there saying, you're telling me I'm not going to be married to him forever? Hallelujah. There's a redemptive out. No, I'm sure that's not where you're going. Some of you would immediately say, it breaks my heart. Because I actually love her. See, here, here's, here's what we need to understand. The best part of your spouse is meant to reveal to you just a little bit more of the Jesus to whom you are married. And in a magnificent way, heaven itself, eternity itself will find our fulfillment and the completion of relationship to Jesus, the ultimate spouse. In fact, of all these free giveaway books, which I think looks like most of them are already gone, Tim and Kathy Keller's book, I think some of you maybe have read that. Anybody read the Keller's book, The Meaning of Marriage? Or was that halfway up? Kind of read half of it? Kind of like, okay, you've got... I would recommend Tim and Kathy Keller's book as the best book that's telling the story we're talking about now. Because Tim and Kathy have, have helped many understand, here's the amazing good news of the richness of relationship with Christ we share. And why right now we want to live with each other, preparing to hand one another off to Him. That we will live... In eternity, with perfected relationships, every one of your relationships in eternity will be perfect. See, only in eternity will we have the capacity to have relationships, perfect ones with everybody. In this lifetime, we are given the calling to live out this one unfolding story of how Jesus loves his church, of how Jesus loves you, about how he is the key to your brokenness, He is the key to your beauty, your longings, your delight. He is the one that is committed to take on the parts of who you are that you had no clue about when you first got married. He is the one that will help you understand that part of your spouse you were always drawn to but did not understand why, but also the part right now that makes you feel very much shame when you are in their presence. The Lord is at work to make us like himself. And a growing, healthy Christian marriage begins to understand that. Well, let me offer one more point, then we're going to take that initial break. And then I'm going to come back because the second part of plan A, you see to the right of the picture, you see a gospel-shaped marriage. We're going, to, we're going to go into that a little bit more tonight in terms of just really pondering the design and uh Again, tomorrow morning, Darlene and I are going to be filling in the blanks on what does this look like over 46 years for us. Um, Let me go ahead and tease it out a little bit by one of the first things I will uh, ask Darlene tomorrow morning will be this. So, honey, what was it like to live with a husband with a frozen heart for the first 25 years of our marriage? How was that working for you? Because that's what my wife had. We have done our most important growth in this story a quarter of a century into our marriage. So don't go be telling me you can't, tell, you can't teach a new dog, an old dog, new tricks. You're not dogs, you're image bearers of God. Neither one of us, when we got married, had any clues about our brokenness. Neither one of us knew that we were both childhood survivors of sexual abuse. Neither one of us understood the many ways that we tried to make our life work as Christians, even apart from a greater knowledge of the Father's life. And so we're speaking these images now because they come to us from God's word, wanting us to know this is what I made you for. This is what I have for you by my grace. Again, we're going to make some of those connectors, but I want to finish right now before this break at that. If you look under the picture, there's a fourth. There is a fourth affirmation of the life God designed us for in Eden that I just, I'm so glad leading up to break to highlight. 
When you look at Eden, when you look at this unfolding story of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, some of you know those words. That's what these four panels stand for. The life of creation is revealed in Genesis 1 and 2. The fall, the tragedy of what sin and death did to disrupt, to distort, to decay. Redemption, what it looks like, the unfolding story through Jesus, how grace is greater than we ever imagined. With a view to the hope, what will the finished story look like? Well, both in Eden and right now with your spouse, this fourth affirmation of that God's design is so key and strategic. And I love what God's doing with us right now in this one. If you look at Eden, God made us for fruit, fruitful partnership, side-by-side mission, adventure and fruitfulness with God and your spouse. When God said to Adam and Eve that they were called as equals, different but equal. Let me say this again. The story the Bible is telling that in Christian marriage, in marriage, we are equal but different. There is not a hierarchy of gender. We are equal but different. And God's design is that Adam and Eve together would move into his world to create culture and life, to fill the earth with his glory. Our dignity, listen to this, our dignity as image bearers of God is primarily seen in terms of our commitment to know God, love God, and reveal God in our world. The essence of depravity is to do exactly the opposite, to put ourselves in God's place. And what that ends up for a lot of people of religion falling into, it ends up us giving God bit parts in our story rather than us finding our place in his story. Now, here's what you're going to find moving forward. This picture of fruitful partnership is this. Some of you are unbearably bored and boring because you've lost the missional orientation of what God has always designed marriage to be about. God never designed marriage to be two selfish people staying at home, suffering a tick on a dog relationship with no dog. It's a mouthful. (laughs) Got that image? Just, Just go with the last part of the phrase. A tick on a dog relationship, only two ticks and no dog. What does that look like? Anybody got a dog that's ever had a tick? Confession time. You know, it's a nasty thing, right? Who likes to pick ticks off dogs? What does a tick do? It's a parasite. It attaches itself, and it basically says, I'm along for a free ride, and you are my source and supply. The worst marriage in the world, two ticks and no dogs, you simply give yourself to take life from another. Men and women, God made you to live in his world with an outward-facing gaze. Right now, and Darlene may mention this a little bit tomorrow because it's just fascinating. See, when grace begins to free you from simply being obsessed with your identity, your possessions, your being adored, when grace begins to free you to know you're at homeness with the Father, you begin to say, Lord, what is history all about? What are you doing in your world? And how can we partner together moving forward? In the last... Gosh, I guess just months it is, honey. It's been that recently. We've been brought into part of God's story in the world called human trafficking. And I have nothing to boast about here. It's not like we're experts in anything. In fact, I'm just, I'm following my courageous wife into a story of beginning to understand. You know, when, when we find our home in the heart of God and the, and the, his great love for us, we begin to show up in God's commitment to Take on the systemic brokenness of this world. And you may end up giving a little of that story tomorrow, so I'm not going to kind of go there. But let's, let's do this. Let me pray for us. Let's take a break. And then we're going to come back. And just for the, you know, well, I should say this before the break. Here's something I mentioned to Mitchell. I would, uh, we love for couples to do at this event. Would you start writing down questions without your name on it that you would like us risk asking, answering while we're together? Again, just maybe during the break, you start thinking, I was coming to this thing, and this is so what I would hope at some point somebody would say something about. 
could even be something that even in this opening broad theme of looking at God's story that's intriguing or confusing to you, but what might be questions that you would write out on a piece of paper, leave, leave on a table, put on our table or something like this, and, uh, and we want to move forward. Maybe I'll even take a peek at some of those tonight before we get you guys into some line dancing or something. But we're going to, what is it now? Swing, excuse me. That's, did I just insult you saying line dancing, Mitchell? You kind of gave me a pushback there like, you know, that is so blasé, you know. That's what y'all do in Nashville. Point is this. We really, there are, you know, there are plenty of on-ramps for you to ask questions, and, uh, and I really want you to do this. So let me pray. We'll take about a 10-minute break. We'll come back, and then we're going to move into really making a little bit more clear connections about what a gospel-shaped marriage actually looks like. So let me pray for us here. Father, thank you so much for your great love for us and your commitment, Lord, to help us look at the ways we've taken on stories, we've, we've, we've been narrated, we've put the pen in authors' hands that are not writing with the ink of grace. Lord, some of us are a lot more religious then we are alive to your love. Some of us just are simply mean and self-centered and navel-gazing and self-absorbed. Some of us, Lord, so are desperate just for your spirit to break in and do something fresh. And you love us all equally. Oh, Father, help us to enjoy one another's company, Lord. Help us to begin to know that Uh, Lord, your welcoming heart is here for one and all. Thank you for chocolate. Thank you for beverage. Thank you for the chance to stretch at the end of perhaps for many what's been a very busy, exhausting week. Help us, Lord, just to um, know that you are at work in our gathering. And uh, Lord, and uh, just then take us, Lord, into that good conversation about uh, helping us understand what a what a marriage actually shaped by grace, what it can look like, what 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 grace and play in these marriages can look like, Lord, as you connect us with the echoes of Eden, as you show us our nostalgia and our hearts for the fullness of your story and the completion that you've designed for us. Again, God, thank you that you're a lot more generous and creative and kind than we ever hoped or imagined. And all, all of these things are true because Jesus truly is who you claim that he is. We offer praise in his name and thanksgiving and expectation. Amen. Well, welcome. Up, and please keep hitting the dessert table. I mean, go back for seconds. It's okay. This is a family-style conversation. And uh, what I think would be good uh, even as we see if even from the floor uh, you would like some questions to be answered in terms of clarifying some things, but just look to the right side in your notes, and this might give us a chance to kind of further summarize a little bit more of what we're talking about in terms of the actual story that God designed for our marriages. And, And there's a lot of ways we can think about why we want to take that seriously. But let me just highlight something that's almost sheer idiocy just to make a point. If I had come out here tonight, and I'd had with me kind of a, for those of you that love the great outdoors, what to your sportsman-like eye would look like a nice tube in which you would assume there's a wonderful rod of some tort, some type. And I were to screw off the top of this rod, and this is an actual rod I have in my mind. And it happens to be a 1940 fly rod that a friend gave me back in Nashville. I mentioned in the world of trafficking, Darlene and I have a dear friend that grew up in South Africa that was rescued out of trafficking. And her husband, is a, they're just a dear, dear friend, dear couple friend of ours. And our, uh, her husband, Bill, uh, invited me into his home and said, Scotty, I've got 17 bamboo fly rods here. Pick any one you want. He simply said, pick up these rods, check the action out, and pick one. Well, if, if you know anything about fly fishing, that's, that's quite a gift. I mean, um, a bamboo fly rod is handmade. Many, if not most of them, are antiques. So I got this one rod. Well, if I'd have brought it out on the stage tonight, had taken it out of its case, and beside me there was a can of nice latex paint, 
and I popped the can on that paint and took that rod and proceeded to stir the paint with my bamboo flower rod. What would you say? What would you want to call me? Moron? Uh, You know, uh, there's a lot of appropriate words. Now, the, the point is this, folks. To use your marriage, even to try to make it functionally work for a while, which I could stir paint with a bamboo flower rod. I could actually do what you need to do when you get that little stirrer stick, right? It would work, but it'd be so destructive. You know, I just, I want us to understand that when we hear the scripture we're not looking at a bunch of rules that we dare not violate. We're invited to ponder beauty, goodness, truth, and 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 really begin to consider: Where have I been stirring paint with a bamboo fly rod? Where have we tried to make this marriage work apart from God's grace? Where where have we where have we? Uh, lived with each other as though we're the fourth member of the Trinity and we're called to fix each other. You know, um, where does my sadness and or my madness invite me to really to ponder what is really hovering below these emotions? And what I risk taking the time to ponder Where might this go? Where might the God of all grace, the God of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, the God who through Jesus is making all things new, what might that look like for us in this season? Well, some language and then one scripture I want to consider just to kind of uh, pull some of this to begin in a framework that we could say. Let's make some connectors and then Darlene and I tomorrow morning will be a little bit more specific about the journey of how we've been learning to grow in grace. And that really tomorrow morning will be, what are the on-ramps for growing in this marvelous grace that is the heartbeat of marriage the way God designed it? So showing and telling God's story of redemption and restoration in and through Jesus. What is a gospel-shaped marriage? If if the gospel would begin to narrate your marriage... Here are three things that we want to affirm about this. Number one, here's the premise. Marriage is primarily a relationship of gospel reenactment by God's design. It's primarily a relationship of gospel reenactment. It's a relationship in which a husband and wife love, cleanse, wash, feed, care, and prepare one another for glory. All in response to how Jesus loves and cares for us in the gospel. Number two, here's the problem. The problem, every human spouse brings stains, wrinkles, and blemishes into the marriage. Some of us are toting more Samsonite than others, but we all bring baggage into marriage. How we deal with our own and one another's baggage largely determines the health, beauty, and integrity of our marriages. What do we bring? We bring sin. We bring beauty. I promise you the person you're married to is a lot more beautiful than they appear in your eye yet. And they're a lot more broken than you ever thought they were. Now, that's not a bad thing. Everybody in this room, when you go to a doctor... What do you really want? You want a true diagnosis, right? You do. Now, if you're like me, when you go to the dentist, you hope every time you go to the dentist, you simply walk out with a little six-month card, a new box of floss, and a new toothbrush, right? It's what you hope. But, you know, if you need to hear these two words, root canal, it's better to hear those words now. I actually had my first one of those two years ago, and it wasn't as bad as I thought, so I've got to find a new image for agony. <laughs> the point is this. Grace diagnoses the true condition. It's not just that law diagnoses a condition. I mean, when you think of a law, typically if you come from any 
thing of a Judeo-Christian background. You think, you know, the law shows us how high the bar is. Well, I would not disagree with that. But you see, grace has a wooing effect. Grace, grace does not just indict, it invites. And what I want you to understand as we think, again, one scripture in particular in a few moments you know, there's a real problem that we need to willingly embrace. What if God made me for something far more glorious than I'm settling for? And what if my condition is so much bigger than I simply need, you know, a little pat on the back, a hug, or a little, you know, kind of encouragement? What, what if I need the grace of Jesus? Well, we do bring sin. We bring beauty. We bring um, integrity. We, we bring darkness, we bring secrets, we bring wounds. We bring different ways of seeing, feeling, and doing things. Different languages, stories, and longings. And you could not have possibly have known that before your honeymoon or after your honeymoon. See, the, the great thing about the God story painting is this. It's a trajectory of ongoing growth. Um, when grace is in play, a husband and wife, uh, they don't have less to repent of. They repent quicker. I mean, one of the things, and I'm sure we'll mention this tomorrow, Darlene and I were so clueless about how to fight good, how to fight fair. Uh, the, the, the imagery would be, uh, and even though her family is not Italian, sometimes we refer to the fact that her, her family was louder and larger than mine. I, I use the language, uh, Italian pasta slinging, not to slam either Italians or pasta. But just to say, she had a passionate context in which she grew up in. You know, my mom was killed in a car wreck when I was 11 years old, and I never saw my parents have one disagreement. You think you're conflict avoidant? You have no clue what conflict avoidance looks like. What but grace can free us to say? There are new ways of moving into conflict. There are, there are ways that, that grace begins to say, you know what, um, my wounds do not excuse anything, but they sure help explain why I'm so afraid. Um, that 25 years in which Darlene lived with me with a frozen heart, you know, when that began to break through a burnout, you know, God gave me the gift of a burnout as a senior pastor, that really began to move me into the journey that Darlene was already in, in terms of beginning to process what did we bring into this marriage we did not understand. Now, and I'm not going to run ahead to tomorrow morning because I can't wait for your darling to tell that story. But I'm just giving you little thoughts to think about. So maybe the person you're so irritated with right now, maybe there's more to them. Uh, this is going to sound stereotypical, so forgive me. It's just for the sake of the economy of time. Um, some of us in this room who are really presenting mad a lot of the time, angry, rigid, gruff. We're simply a lot more comfortable doing mad than owning the real sad that just runs through our whole system. And a part of what grace will enable you to do is to begin to understand really the way God, through grace, dialogues with his children just like he did with Jonah. Jonah. Do you remember that marvelous scene in Jonah chapter 4? Jonah has already been turned into whale vomit, you know. Nice, delightful image after that brownie you just ate. Yeah, indeed, sometimes God will move from three-foot waves to six-foot waves to appointing large fish to swallow people that maybe are slow learners. But here's what I love about the book of Jonah. Not so much that scene of his being thrown overboard and all that, although that's a hard providence that brought some deliverance. But the way God talks to his sons and daughters in different seasons of disconnect, longing, loss, sadness, and madness, Jonah chapter 4. 
God gives us the gift of a disconnected heart. Jonah says this to God. Isn't this exactly what I told you before I went to freaking Nineveh? I knew you to be a God who was abounding in mercy, slow to anger, full of mercy and compassion. That's why, Jonah says, it's better for me to die than to live. Now, why would that be a gift to you and me tonight in the beginning of a marriage conversation that right now is talking about a grace-shaped marriage that gives on-ramps for freedom? Look at how God pursues us to go below the waterline of our words to get into our hearts. Do you remember the next thing in Jonah 4, God says to Jonah, Jonah, do you have a right to be angry? Why are you so angry? This isn't God saying to Jonah, you little pipsqueak, who do you think you are getting upset? You want something to be angry about? I'll give you something to cry about. This is God inviting Jonah and the disconnected heart, the contradiction between the words that reflect a good theology, a man whose heart is invited to be brought out into the open. God dialogues with you in the gospel by his grace. He doesn't diatribe at you. This is not buck up, get your act together, thus saith the Lord. It's getting low because grace runs downhill. So if God were to ask you tonight, just in terms of just even some of these images, you know, we're made to share a life of adventure, getting to know the ultimate spouse, Jesus, but we're carrying all this baggage, all this Samsonite. Do you have any clue right now what that looks like in your own journey? Here's the promise. The promise, along with the premise, taking on the problem. We are dearly loved by Jesus, the perfect spouse. Therefore, we live with hope. It's the indicatives of Jesus' grace for us that empower the imperatives of our love for our spouse. Now, let's just take a look at one scripture here just to kind of consider what we will want to reinforce as the rhythm of a gospel-shaped marriage, a grace-kissed, empowered marriage. And it's this image, and we could look at several passages, but I really like what Paul does here in Colossians 3, beginning to show us that Moving forward with our human spouse must be redirected as moving forward with our heavenly spouse. Now, what do I mean by that? Look at, look at, the, look at the brilliance here. Colossians 3.12. What does Paul do? He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now let's just take a, let's just set our gaze on this one passage. And and with this, we'll kind of move in to see if there's Question or two from the floor before we get you guys for whether it's buck dancing, spin dancing, line dancing, or whatever it is. Just, just, just marinate in these words. Who are we? But before we start wearing the burden of, you know, sometimes in Christian subculture, we think it's always supposed to be about, okay, just be nicer. Try hard to be nicer. Folks, are you worn out trying hard being nice? Are you tired of pretending and posing? Good. I'm glad to see somebody saying, heck yeah. (laughs) You mean there's relief for posing and pretending and trying hard? Yeah. It's called take on in a fresh way the way God's relating to us. Look at these words. Who who are we before we do anything? It's God's chosen people. Notice it doesn't say choice people. Nothing choice about us. 
In Scripture, the, the image of chosen, it, 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 it's developed in Scripture. It's, it's, it becomes one of the themes of the wedding feast of the Lamb. Who are those that show up at the great wedding of Jesus to his people? They are rebels, fools, and idolaters. They are the unlikelies, the throwaways. They're, the, they're, the, they're, the, they're not just the Cinderella. You know, in the story of Cinderella, she kind of earned her way into the prince's embrace, right? I mean, look at her. She's so pretty and clean in the gospel. It's the, it's the mean stepmother and the ugly sisters that get in the party. This is a radical story of we're, 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 we're wanted, we're desired, and yet we whittle down our expectation thinking, we'll just let one human being love me and it'll be enough. It will never be enough. Never, never, never. That's why Solomon got crazy and had a thousand concubines and it wasn't enough. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy. Now, don't let that word scare you. But even unique to say, I say holy, you say what? You know, I don't know what you say. Sit up straight. Don't squirm. You know, I grew up thinking this trapezoid muscle my mom used to pinch. You know, don't squirm. Don't write on the bulletin. That's God's bulletin. <laughs> you know, I, I confused reverence with rigor mortis. What does holy mean? Holy, you know, holy means holy means simply it means set apart. It means it's the language of desiredness. Ever ponder one of the richest images in the whole of Scripture about Jesus' love for us, bridegroom to bride, Song of Solomon, images that are meant to be we are to give each other a taste of in our marriages, but they are all meant to connect us with the heart of Jesus for us. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. His banner over me is love. Now, where in your world do you connect with any of that? Just think about that. I mean, just think, think if that really is what the Scripture's meaning for us to say as we ponder how God loves his people. So that your heart and my heart could say, and again, not, not in some kind of weird, disconnected sentimental spirituality, but in the core of your being, your heart is able to say, I belong to my God and his desire is for me. His banner over me is love. That's not privatizing the gospel. That will give you the empower, the power you need to live with a fellow sinner saint in brokenness and love and longing until the day one of you hands the other off to God in eternity. As God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved. I love adverbs. I love adjectives. If you listen to me all this week, you realize I'll use 17 words where three would be adequate. I just love words. And, and I hope some of that's born out of looking at how redemptively superfluous the Bible is by wanting to mount up adjectives and prepositions and words just to say it's so much better than you know. Friends, you are dearly loved. It's, you know what? It's awesome when you are well loved by a spouse. But it's magnificent in your heart of hearts to know that you are dearly loved by the living God. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved. Now we begin to move and to begin to think about. So what, what can marriage be that's more shaped by this story, not the escaping the crazy of my family story, marriage, not the Jerry Maguire, you fill me up, or you better. Just living in relationship with this God, his grace, his kindness, we, we, we begin to move into marriage or even the uniquenesses of parenting. I mean, isn't it kind of God's holy setup for a marriage weekend and Mother's Day to be on the same weekend? Talk about setups. How many opportunities can we have to fail? <laughs> It's perfect timing. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, why, why would we put on the garments of grace towards one another? Because this is exactly what God wears as he thinks about you. Who do you suppose is most compassionate, kind, Yes, humble, gentle, and patient with you. 
It's not who you're married to. It's the God you're running from, pissed off at, think you know, but are stiff-arming. He really, 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 really does. It's why God says even such profound things as through his scripture, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Not his threats, not his bribes. Where's the kindness of God showing up you in your story right now, maybe even through the suffering? Again, you'll hear from Darlene and I, we've done more of our growth in this reality, taking on the brokenness of our stories, being able to give each other God's welcoming heart when we felt so much shame. No one has had more impact of helping me see the depth of my fear and my shame than Darlene, and no human being has provided more on-ramps for me to sit there and dare to believe that God can love me in that mess. And folks, I've had bunches of mess. And I don't even want to put that in the past tense. Bear with each other and forgive. Well, let me even back up here a little bit. You know, I get a few more minutes. I mean, look at the language here. Uh, you know, that, that we would know this is, this is the way God is towards us right now, all because that third panel is true. Jesus actually did do everything necessary to reconcile us to God. It is Jesus' righteousness, not our own. It is his intercession for us, not even our own wimpy prayer lives. It is his advocacy over us. It's his coming for us that risks enables us to risk believing that this is the way God's thinking, pondering, relating to us now, and therefore we can begin to cultivate a culture of kindness and encouragement in our marriage. That would be the last thing we won't talk about Sunday morning in that combined Sunday school class. What would it look like for you and for me to say to your spouse, let's sign on for as the God of resurrection supplies us. Let's intentionally build a culture of encouragement and kindness in this marriage until Jesus takes one of us home. If you don't think in those terms, why would you think you would even begin to even want to or know what such a culture would look like? We're going to give you plenty of opportunities to think about what that can mean, even as in this church, in a fresh way, you start fighting for each other's marriages. Folks, this is not Han Solo weekend here. Every marriage in this room needs other marriages. You can not, your marriage is your neighbor's marriage. And there's just something awesome when you begin to walk in community with other couples that would say, in a profound way, even in this most recent culture, in a truly profound way, us too. We need Jesus too. In fact, let me tell you, I think one of the sweetest things that could even in a small way begin to happen at First Pres, even just with a, a, just a portion of the couples in this room, just imagine moving forward that this would be the new small group reality, the new culture engagement, or how couples relate to one another in this church. And I love the fact that we've got some, you know, some colders that some couples that haven't been as married as old as Darlene and I. Honey, I'm still glad we got the prize, but. Imagine couples of many ages beginning to take on the story that we find in Mark chapter 2, one of my favorite stories of friendship and coupleship. Mark chapter 2. Do you know the story? Jesus is beginning his public ministry. Mark is telling his story a lot more staccato fashion. He's writing in view of the imminent persecution in Rome, and there's this story that Mark tells so uniquely. He talks about the day when Jesus now is beginning to uh, grow in public attention. And there are four friends that hear that Jesus is close by. And they have a paralyzed friend. And these four friends grab the, ostensibly the four corners of the pallet upon which their friend is laying. And what do they do? They take him to Jesus. And what do they do? They get to Jesus. The house is full of people. So they climb up on the roof. They take the tiles off the roof. And they lower their friend to Jesus. Can you imagine what it would be? If five couples would say, in our church family, let's live out that story together. Let's learn to take each other to Jesus. And let's all take our turn on the pallet. Let's share our brokenness with one another. 
Let's learn how through prayer, encouragement, just to build a rhythm at First Pres, downtown, beautiful San Antonio, of men and women coming alive to the only love that's better than life, owning our weakness, embracing our brokenness, pulling for each other, running after one another, when, like Jonah, we want to get a one-way ticket to Tarshish. You know, Darlene and I had a couple, Jack and Rosemary Miller, who gave us the enormous gift of simply living out before us, coming alive to grace, and watching that further move into their marriage. We walked with them for 21 years until Jack, at 67 years old, was taken by our father to heaven uh, uh, from a life of missions. His wife, Rose Marie, is 93 now. We just prayed with her this week. She's getting ready to go back to London to share the gospel just with the beautiful people of London. They lived out before us. Christian marriage isn't about pretending and posing. It's about knowing that grace is sufficient for all of us. Well, look at these images. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. There's nothing more daily in life than forgiveness. But there should be something far more There should nothing be more hourly than in life than me staying aware to how God has forgiven me of my sin. When grace is in play in a marriage, here's what begins to happen. You really, really do believe that the log in your eye is always more of an issue than the speck in your spouse's eye. Let me say that again. It's getting late. When grace is in play in your marriage... When the gospel shaping your marriage, you really do believe, you really believe, you come back to it, you, you forget it, but you come back to it, you really believe that the log in your eye is always more of an issue than the speck in your spouse's eye. And that is freedom, folks. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to make you so maybe a thousand times more aware of where your spouse is broken than Jesus is beautiful. Say that again. The devil wants you to be at least a thousand times more aware of where your spouse is broken than, where, than, than Jesus is beautiful. And this scripture, and again, we could look at so many. We're going to look at one Sunday morning in the corporate worship service that just will override our circuit board with how much God loves us. But we're coming back to this. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, in conclusion, I'll say this. What, what, what in essence, Paul has just described here is this. So here's the the premise, here's the problem, here's the promise of of, of a marriage shaped by the gospel. Uh, The the, the premise is it, it, it it does have intentionality. There is a design. God means something for this relationship, and it's better than most of us settle for. And it's, it's about living in relationship with Jesus, with your spouse, coming alive to his love. And it's, it's entering into the problem, embracing the fact that we should not be shocked that we'll be in more discovery mode about our beauty and our brokenness the longer we live together. But the promise is there will be Grace for that. And we will, as we daily get up every day and go into the claws and decide what's appropriate for this day, whether it's a tuxedo or T-shirt and cutoffs, we're going to start learning how to put on the garments of grace every freaking day. I say freaking just because I'm just a southerner underscoring. You do it every day. What will we put on? Who will we be more aware of? May God truly bring his grace and mercy to bear. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for us now. In fact, honey, would you come up here and pray? I want them to hear your lovely voice as you pray for us in conclusion, getting us ready. You're a little hoarse, but you're a lot, Darlene. Come up around here. Um, and, and, and Mitch, our dance king expert, is going to tell us what's next. Um, 
We're probably going to go home and pray for tomorrow to be with you guys. So yeah, looking forward to that. Go to sleep. That's right. That's, we got up at three this morning to get here. So we're kind of, we're a little sleepy. Um, please write out any questions. If you have anything specifically, you know, when to leave tonight or bring questions tomorrow morning and we'll make some good margin for Q and A. So I'm just going to have Darlene pray over us now. Pray for this night. Pray that Lord will have his way and sway in these uh, next hours. So. Father God, thank you for each person here. Thank you for each marriage that's represented. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for Jesus who came and lived and died and rose again. Lord, you know each hurting place in each heart this weekend. And Lord, we pray that you will bring healing and hope. And Lord, that you will unite couples together and help them, Lord. Help us, help Scotty and I, help each of us here, Lord, to see more your beauty in our spouse and to truly not just look at the the log that we think we see in, in them. Um. So, Lord, we ask you to undo us, and we ask you to bind us up. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me tell you what we want to do this morning, knowing that this class would be a wonderful, broad swath of men and women in different seasons of life, and also acknowledging that this is a very relational weekend. This is Mother's Day. And uh, Darlene and I have been, this weekend, afforded the great honor of being with a uh, many couples, uh, dozens of couples, Friday night, Saturday morning. And so thinking about those that are joining us from that event, but also those of us that were not together, what I want to do is to start with uh, walking us through for the first part of our class, what I believe to be, without a doubt, one of the most foundational passages in the New Testament about how we are to think relationally, no matter who we are. Married, single, married, wishes, wishing we weren't married, single, wishing we were married, with kids, with no kids, wish we never had kids, wish we had 17 grandkids. I think I've covered it all. All of us, I would like for us to take a few moments before we move into some practical ways of talking about um, building a culture of encouragement and kindness in marriage and other relationships I want to turn our attention to the second chapter of Philippians. So if you have a Bible with you, if you have something electronic uh, that would enable you to turn and look at a passage of Scripture, we're going to look at this foundational passage. I will be preaching another one from the Old Testament at our combined worship service at 11. But in Philippians chapter 2, there is this passage that Paul writes to a congregation uh, in a season of relational stress. Uh, We certainly don't have time to go through the whole book of Philippians. We would not need to, but if we were to fast forward into the fourth chapter, there's a fascinating dynamic going on in the church that uh, is about a broken relationship. And we don't know all the specifics. We don't have to know, but we do know that in Philippians 4, there were two very gifted, godly women who were serving with Paul in the church of Philippi. Their names were Euodia and Syntyche. You probably did not name your children or grandchildren Euodia or Syntyche. But they were affirmed as two partners in the gospel with Paul, which I think is marvelous for a lot of reasons, just realizing that God has made us all to serve Him. And uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were were equally image bearers of God and fully engaged and uh, and, and having the commission of God to fill the earth with His glory. Well, we don't know what the backstory was in Philippians 4, but these two women got turned sideways with each other. And uh, Paul appeals to them to agree. Paul appeals to them to work out their differences. And... uh, Again, don't know if that was exactly like Kay Arthur and Beth Moore having competing Bible studies, but there, there was a, a wrinkle and a wrangle there. And uh, 
But what Paul did earlier in the letter in Philippians 2 was to posit this incredible picture of here is the wellspring of every relationship if you know Jesus. Here's the kingpin, the vision, here's the source and supply of how you want to think about yourself as a relational person. So let me read, uh, starting with verse 1 of chapter 2, Philippians, several of these verses, and we're going to see um, some very unique dynamics emerging about how Paul says, this is how you are to think about relating to Jesus. Uh, this, is, this is the invitation to go even deeper into the riches of grace as you consider your world of relationships right now, whether they're beautiful or broken or beautiful and broken. Uh, word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for his word. Paul writes, Philippians 2.1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me pray for one moment. Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you for this marvelous church, this incredible community of grace. How we pray uh, in these next uh, 40 minutes or so that you would truly encourage us about what it means to be in relationship with Jesus. And out of that, would you help us think about um, marriage, about singleness, about friendship, about even um, on a Mother's Day, what it means to feel all the, all the gratitude of what it means to be both sons and daughters and mothers, but also the, the challenges that go with that. Um, bring glory to yourself, we pray in Christ's name and for his eternal honor. Amen. Now just a few things where Paul begins this text. This is just really profound. He writes, by the way, Darling's sitting here not like we're in a southern church and this is the queen mother and that she's in session. She's actually we're going to share some of the other so you know, I didn't want her to feel too awkward like a lot of people looking at her is the queen mother. But, anyway. but notice what Paul does. He's assuming several things. One, he's assuming everybody wants encouragement. He's assuming everybody wants comfort, wants love. He's assuming these are good things. You know, you're not selfish to have real longings for deep connection. That's not selfishness. If you have any encouragement, if you comfort, Fellowship with the Spirit, tenderness and compassion. Now just think about those words as evidence of good longing. And, and, and these are good things to want. Now often those good things get frustrated or sabotaged by trying to find fulfillment of those in ways that don't work. Right? And, and this is why before Paul talks about horizontal relationships, he says... This is the way we need to be thinking and growing in grace. Do we actually experientially, do we actually existentially, which means in reality, not just theory, do we really find encouragement through our union with Christ? Does His love comfort us? Now, let me pause for a moment there. Uh, those are awesome invitations, but they're also 
In some ways, um, maybe the word indictment is too strong, but it, it's meant to startle us. For, for instance, some of us would say maybe today, no, I, I'm a Christ follower. I, I'm a member of First Pres. I, I believe in God, believe in Jesus. But I'm not sure what you mean by encouragement from union with Christ, comfort from His love. Well, if we didn't talk about anything else today, that would be sufficient right there. Because I want us to think about that for a minute. So according to the scripture, why should we be encouraged sitting here today only because we are in union with Christ? And that language, that phrase, union with Christ, is a better descriptor of what it means to be a Christian than anything else. You know, to be a Christian, according to the Bible, is not simply you inviting Jesus into your heart. It's really Jesus giving you a brand new heart. It's not you simply deciding to turn away from a certain lifestyle and beginning to follow Jesus as your moral example. It's, it's, it's not really what the Bible says being a Christian is. To be a Christian means that God, who is rich in mercy, uh, raised us from our spiritual deadness, forgave all of our sins, past, present, and future sins, not just the 4% you're aware of, and literally dressed you, clothed you in the righteousness of Jesus and, and, and hid, uh, literally deposited your life in Jesus. This union with Christ is not just metaphorical, it's metaphysical, it's actual. We, we are in union with Christ. Now, we not, may not be aware of it. We may, may not be enjoying it. But it is meant to absolutely define everything about us so that when we start looking at our human relationships marriage singleness friendships uh, mother-child relationship whatever we don't over expect human relationships to give us what relationship with Jesus alone can give us see uh, as we met those of us that were in the marriage event this week and we talked about one of the important things about marriage is adjusting expectations uh, raising expectations for what it means to be in relationship with God, but, but you know, no spouse, no child, no parent can be Jesus to anybody else. There's only one Jesus, and Jesus is really good at being Jesus. And this is why Paul just gives this incredible picture. Do you have encouragement right now today from being united with Christ? See, some of us would have a spiritual story that would look like this. Oh, I remember when I was in high school or I remember when I was in college and yeah, I finally believed the gospel and I felt so new and fresh and everything felt so different. And then what? You could finish the sentence. Life got busy or I went through suffering or I just kind of, you know, got preoccupied with other stuff and relationship with Jesus was not as real, fresh, or dear. See, then these words might for some of you be coming back to first love. Like re realizing that maybe even a, a difficult marriage, challenging marriage, or a new season of singleness, or, or, or maybe a, a profound sense of aloneness because I've never really been in human relationships that are completely fulfilling. That, that might be a way of God saying, you know what? You were always designed to find your richest fullness and connection in me. And uh, many times good church people like us, we can live out that story of the drift of men and women uh, in the church of Ephesus. You, probably like me, you love the letter of Ephesians. It's just filled with rich theology and practical instructional relationships. Well. After that letter was completed by Paul, 20 to 25 years later, the resurrected Jesus had some other words to say to the same church. If you, if you, you know, love the book of Revelation like I do, um, you'll remember that the second and third chapters in the book of Revelation contain seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. The first one is what Jesus says to his beloved bride in Ephesus. And you remember what he says? Because it's really, I think it connects with this weekend and this morning so well. 
Jesus says to the church of Ephesus, Revelation 2, verses 1 and following, you know, um, have so much to commend in you. You know, you have stood strong in the face of persecution. You have guarded the gospel. You have even hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, we really don't know who they were, but they were obviously the bad guys. They were teaching something wrong. But then he says this. Jesus says this. But this I have against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Now, you know what's remarkable about that? It shows us that Jesus is aware of when our hearts drift from, from him. And it matters to him. Do you know the name Abraham Kuyper? He was just a great Dutchman. He was actually the prime minister of the Netherlands. Uh, prime minister, uh, created the Free University of Amsterdam. Just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man and a deeply devotional Christian. And he once said, and, and my, one of my wife's favorite devotional studies uh, on Psalm 73, Kuyper said, the most amazing thing that God can say to any of us is that he is jealous for our love. The very fact that God wants your heart. God wants you to know him in a deep way, not just a nice ethical, get your life together way, not do more, try harder, but to see, as Paul's writing in Philippians, there's encouragement, there is comfort from his love. Let's even think about that for a minute. Why should we be comforted by the love of God, by the love of Jesus? In fact, this, this, I don't have to, I'm not, this is not stand-up lecture time here. Let's just see if any of you can kind of just speak out as a class. What is comforting about the love of Jesus? Just what, what comes to your mind? What, what comfort is there in knowing that Jesus loves you? What's comforting about that? Anything comes to mind? Excuse me? Peace. Peace, yeah. There's just a... It can be a profound sense of peace, like when everything else is wrong in my world, Jesus loves me right now. God the Father loves me right now, and I can't add to that or take away from that. That's really profound, if, if that's my reality, right? Anything else? How does the love of Jesus, how, how can it comfort us? Other thoughts? It's always unconditional. There. It's always there. It's steady. It's, 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 it's not like any other human love, right? You know, uh, Every other human love is conditioned upon certain things, right? That's why some of us grew up in middle school, you know, if not literally thinking theoretically about our first love. She loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, pulling off the daisy petals. And some of us live with God like that, unfortunately. Some of us that don't understand the gospel of His grace still think, I bet God's kind of disappointed in me today because I didn't have good quiet times this week. I yelled at the kids. I, you know, was just, you know... I didn't do casserole duty for the elderly shut-ins. So he's probably sad with me or others of us foolishly thinking, I got a bigger check last week at church. I think God's really proud of me. He wants to high-five me somewhere in the universe. We foolishly think that our relationship with God is like our other relationships, that we earn affection and we lose affection by what we do. Paul's point is this. When every other relationship you are a part of is conditioned upon humanity and brokenness and performance, there is one constant, steady relationship that is always in place. And that's why he says, Paul says, if you're encouraged through your union with Christ, if you're comforted by his love, if the, if the Holy Spirit right now, look at the second part of verse 1, and from this, Darlene and I are going to begin shifting into kind of look at some common ways of growing in this grace and extending it to each other from the notes that we have. But a couple more comments from the text. If you have encouragement from being united with Christ, if comfort from His love, if fellowship with the Spirit, tenderness and compassion. A couple of things there. When Paul highlights here the ministry of the Holy Spirit, what is he wanting us to understand? Well, he's wanting us to think about um, our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And, and that would invite us, even in view next Sunday in the church calendar, is Pentecost Sunday. And we want to ponder, why did God give us his Holy Spirit? And what is one of the primary ministries of the Holy Spirit? in the life of every believer. Well, one of those ministries in Romans 8, 
Paul writes in Romans 8, 16, for God's spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. So one of the main things God's Holy Spirit is committed to do in your life every day, if you're tuning your ear to hear, is to tell you how much the Father loves you. How much Jesus truly knows, loves, wants, and desires you. Now we're going to build on that this morning in our combined worship service. But do you, do you see what Paul's doing here? Even before he starts talking about the church, guys, you've got to get along better. You need to learn how to repent quicker and conflict redemptively. He says, all healthy, robust relationship flows out of fresh, current relationship that God has given us in Christ and makes real by the Holy Spirit. Now that's really good stuff, folk. Let me say this again. You, you, you're Some of you coming in and you're thinking, I don't like this room. I like my other Sunday school room. Marriage conference. I'm not married or, I, or, or, well, good news. We're all in relationship with this God who wants us to know Him like this. So how can we cultivate it together? What, could, what can we do to go in a more practical way moving forward uh, in, in all of our relational settings. Well, I'll invite my beautiful wife to come stand with me up here. And uh, all we're gonna do is, and this is again uh, for us, just, you know, the very fact that I can stand with Darlene is a, is a huge gift because uh, for those of us that were together this weekend, we, we shared a lot of brokenness. We shared a lot of, uh, through our 46 years of marriage that, um, uh, they have been filled with rapture and rupture. All kinds of seasons of how, how could heaven itself be better than this to, Lord, you know, take me to heaven soon. It would be better by far to depart to be with you. So <laughs> just the reality of a relationship, whether it's marriage, you know, relationships, unlike anything else, stir up our longings, expose our brokenness, and can make the gospel very real. So what, what we have note-wise is, um, you know, for, for Darlene and I in this season, we just had our 46th anniversary last Saturday, Cinco de Mayo, 1972 is when uh, we got married. And uh, we have committed um, to try to cultivate a relationship, of, a culture of kindness and encouragement in our marriage uh, moving forward. Uh, out of God's great love for us. So what you have in your outline, and I'm just going to kind of go through a lot of these, and we'll just kind of talk about, you know, practically what this looks like. But I think it's fascinating as we think about uh, having a culture of kindness and encouragement in our relationship world. It's important to know that the, the absolute only command mentioned in the New Testament with this qualifier, and all the more as you see the great day of Jesus approaching, is encouragement. I mean, literally, the Bible says, encourage one another, and all the more as you look forward to the day when Jesus will come back. That is the only command in the New Testament that we are to do more and more and more. Now, that's, that, that's obeyable. We can actually do that. But it's intentional because in our marriages, in our friendships, we want to say, am I consciously committed out of the encouragement I know in relationship with God to live as an encourager, not as a fixer, not as a primary whiner, complainer, self-appointed critic in this marriage or, or parenting world or whatever else, but am I living as an encourager? So let's look at this. I've got, again, we got some just some practical handles and uh, um, uh, but look at these. So what are some of the things we can do to build that culture of encouragement based upon gospel reality? Well, the first one is this. Take care of yourself. Preach the gospel to yourself daily. Exercise, eat well, dazzle your heart with Jesus. Now, let me unpack some of that language. It may sound kind of absolutely weird or abstract. You know, you hear the phrase, preach the gospel to your heart. Let me tell you why that's a phrase that matters to us. And it doesn't mean go get yourself a Home Depot kit, build yourself a podium, put it in front of a mirror, and pretend to be Billy Sunday. It's not practice, you know, what Mitchell does and Bob does so well. You too could be a preacher on the staff at First Press. Now, see, the very word preach, it just announced good news. 
That's all the word preach means. It's not even about a talking style. Um, you're always talking to yourself. Everybody in this room talks to yourself. Now, hopefully not as you're walking through the mall and someone's <laughs> overhearing you. But I'm talking about that kind of talking to yourself. But every, every one of you, you're, you're narrating your life. And other people are narrating your life. So, so what are you intentionally exposing your heart with? Now, if you grew up in a world of contempt, and some of you did, some of you grew up in a family of origin, but the constant messages were, you're not enough, you'll never amount to enough. And some of you are still hearing that from a father that died 17 years ago. You never are gonna get it, are you, son? And, and if there's tapes in your mind that are more present than you realize, a part of what we mean by encouragement is, really learn to Bring the good news of Jesus to bear to your heart. Now, we, we do that differently. Darlene and I are wired very differently. I'm a very early morning person. In fact, in 46 years of marriage, we've actually high-fived each other. I'm getting up. She's going down. Changing of the guard. Night shift. Okay, good night, sweetheart. Good morning, sweetheart. Now, that's rare. I'm not giving you the impression that's what we do. But So, um, I'm going to... Not sure what's going on with our battery here. It's all right. It's, it's surely not a demon that's trying to rob us of our joy. Uh, so, you know, honey, let's just talk about this for each one of us. Um, in terms of uh, ways that we practically learn how, how. How can we keep the gospel current in our heart? What's the, what are ways historically that you have found uh, of uh, you know, everything from spiritual disciplines, reading, meditating, uh, aspects of, of how as surely as we all, we both love to eat good food, we, we feed our hearts spiritually. So, so what, what have been some of the ways historically that God uses to keep His grace real to you? Well, the battery is, I think, going out. I'll take it. communing with the Lord. I know that historically, for instance, even hymns have been a lot to you. So, yeah. so just what are, you know, what are some things that as you think about you know, keeping your own heart aware of grace, God's grace for you in Jesus? What are some of the things that are helpful? Well, I think um, to find really good devotional books for me, I love uh, Jesus is Calling and um, Kuiper and <coughs> Actually, on my phone app, Bible verses will come up every day, which is so helpful if I'm waiting in line somewhere um, in the dentist's office, doctor's office. Just those verses, they come up, and it makes me go to and, him. And, and that, that, you know, I love the image Charlene talking about makes me gaze up. See, at any given season, my eyes are locking somewhere, right? I'm looking at something. Uh, in marriage, since that's been a part of the conversation, if I'm more aware of my spouse's brokenness than the beauty of Jesus, that'll have an outcome. I mean, it, it will. And, and we're not called to be naive about real things we want to deal with, but it's just this picture of how can my heart be more regularly nurtured and nourished with the good news of God's grace and His love. And so, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, what about nature? I know that's you know, part of your just love. Oh, I love nature. How many of y'all love nature? Yeah, it, it's incredible, isn't it? You see God, you hear the birds sing. Uh, right now we're standing here. 
very sweet couple, and they have a golden retriever, and I just adore him. It's like it's a stature God created him. Plus, he's very loving. You know, pets are very forgiving <laughs> and loving. Um, but another thing that helps me too, which I'm, I am not a very consistent person. You know that. I'm not a super self-disciplined person. <coughs> But um, I've recently got the journal and to just start writing out short prayers for people I love. And when I start writing out short prayers and I even get to the part of, this person has really hurt me deeply, Lord. <laughs> and it, it's like, okay, Lord, I need to bring this person to you. Forgive me, forgive them. Help me know how to move forward. <coughs> um, and then sometimes, because I'm the HA, I'm 67, I don't want people to find certain things I write down. Sometimes I'll tear it up. If it's really deeply personal and it's really been a hard place for me. But lots of times, just to go back, I recently found when I told you it was smart. 2011 and then the next year was 2018. <laughs> so, and it helped me to go back and see, okay, I did this in 2011, and um, so that's helpful too. That's awesome. Now, the, the point is simply this. Um, find for you in this particular season margins and intentionality that, that will simply answer this, answer this question. What am I doing to feast upon the grace of God? God tells me that if I have eyes to see, His majesty is revealed in the things He's made. You know, Don't just go to the beach. Be in awe of the fact that God made the sound of that wave hit, hitting the shoreline. Uh, on our anniversary week, we slowed down a lot. Some several days last week in Destin, Florida, which is an area we love. And it was good for me to remember again the sound of the surf and literally to worship God. Thank you. Or thank you for the tug of a pompano on the end of my line and the beautiful colors that that fish uh, turns into just before I consume it on my plate. Uh, the point being, uh, read the scripture looking for Jesus. Read the scripture wearing the lens of the gospel. Commune, worship, just, you know, if you know your heart has shriveled up, there are fresh ways you can literally bring the good news of grace to bear in your heart through classic spiritual disciplines that become a means of grace and not a means of trying to control God or self-righteousness. Well, let's just look at several more here because we want to be very, very practical. Again, these are not limited to the context of marriage, but they certainly work. So um, with regard to marriage, but also relationship, here's one of the ways that we can uh, build this culture of encouragement and kindness. Uh, pray your spouse daily, and if possible, pray with your spouse. It's hard to commit heart murder towards someone you are consistently bringing to Jesus. Now, isn't that a novel thought? I can either be rehearsing to myself everything that disappoints me about this marriage, my spouse, my kids, my parents, or we can really learn. Here's one of the ways that we grow in fellowship with the Lord by praying for people by bringing them to a throne of grace represents a shift in your heart now again we like I said in our 46 years of marriage have gone through the seasons of getting emotionally exceedingly disconnected uh, for Darlene and I when we got married neither one of us knew that we were carrying some deep heart wounds we, we both uh, as we discovered many years into our marriage are adult survivors of child, childhood sexual abuse. And, and that took grace for Darlene to start her journey of healing before I could even <clears throat> risk going there. Well, when those seasons are when you're disconnected and you're not sure what you're feeling, you can always pray. You can always pray for someone you're walking with. And I know Darlene prayed for me for years before I, it all got clued in as a man to how emotionally distant I was from her. Now, I, I did a good job of paying the bills, really was relatively present physically. But, you know, th this theme of really um, praying for one another, and if possible, pray with one another. Um, this is one of the gifts that God gave us in our marriage early on, as clueless as we were, for some reason we found it 
pretty easy from the get-go to pray. And, and that still is something we come back to. Uh, for some of you, you, you may think that is the most unlikely thing that will ever happen in this marriage. It will actually pray together. Well, I would just encourage you just to start with it. Maybe nothing more than this. And this is a good prayer. God have mercy on us. Amen. <laughs> you know, to, to, to pray, as Martin Luther said, is to extend an empty hand. Don't compare yourself. In fact, comparison kills community. If you think, pray with my spouse, are you kidding? That is, that's what Mitchell and Bob do from the platform. I could never use all those God words. No, it's just, it's just Lord, we take each other to you, Lord. Just, just, Lord, thank you for our food and thank you for each other. Help us grow in your love. We, we start where we start, right? And, and, and that's, that's a way that we can bring encouragement. It's, it's a way that we can practice a culture of kindness. Let me say this. Um, our ultimate enemy, uh, the dark one himself, knows that he has lost us for eternity. Satan is not omniscient, but he does know this, that if you're a Christian, you belong to the Father forever. So he's going to do anything he can to rob, steal, and kill your heart discourage you, turn you against one another. Uh, foolishly, let us as parents think that we are as, we are as righteous as our parents, as our children are rise up, rising up, calling us blessed. I, I hope no one today is counting on parenting righteousness to get you into heaven. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's good, good reason for always that Jesus' righteousness is alone enough. But you see, you know, praying for each other. Um, um, again, if you find yourself shifting into a real critical season, and, and, and there's some things that greatly concern you, um, be aware of when your anger and disappointment is morphing into murder. Um, and, and, and I don't mean necessarily at all having a plan to do something more than just emotionally, just really... Um, harm someone, but th these are patterns we fall into. And the, and the enemy wants you to see far more your brokenness, far more your spouse's brokenness than the beauty of Jesus. Uh, some more practical things we can do. Um, here, look at this one, and, and this may seem cheesy, but it's really profound. Uh, in our relationships, and again, as we think of marriage, catch each other doing it right, not just doing it wrong. Now, Darlene and I had to have some... Uh, vocabulary adjustments. One of the counselors we worked with said, I just really want to encourage you guys to get rid of two words, always and never. And, and, and you've heard that before. If you've been in any, any setting where Christian marriage was talked about, you were warned about those words, always and never. You know, How come, Scotty, you never take out the trash? To which, what's your usual logical response when someone says never? Never? Don't you remember two weeks ago? You know, you make a defense. So we, we fall into attack and defend. But what if we begin to say, here's how God, according to the gospel, is addressing us, thinking about us, pursuing us all the time. It is to build us up. In fact, God says through His Scripture that it is His kindness that even leads us to repentance. Not shaming, not blaming, it's the kindness of God that leads us to say, Lord, thank you for your mercy. What would it look like, whether you've been married 15 minutes or 15 years or 46 years like us? In fact, those who were together this weekend heard Darlene and I say, our most important growth in our marriage happened, started happening 25 years in. Now please sit in that. Some of you aren't even 25 years old yet. <laughs> if you assume... We've just been this way too long. We're just biding our time. We've got, you know, got the living will in place. You know, one of us is going to die quicker than the other. Then, then two people will be happy. Now, <laughs> don't hold on. Hold, hold out. Lord, what would mercy look like? What would it mean for kindness to begin to come in as an expression of the gospel? You, you love us like this. And so, uh, you know, um, we've been really working on that. Just working harder to say thank you. Just amazing, Darlene will often say, it meant a lot when you call me today. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, yeah, you know, well, thank you for thanking me. 
and you're not going to become like those Walt Disney two little chipmunks, Chip and Dale. Oh, no, 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 no. You're, 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 oh, no, you first. You first. It's not silly. It's profound. Let me tell you. Gratitude and encouragement is a, is a profound protest against darkness. I mean, I mean, that's the language we need to use. Encouragement and gratitude are protest. Protest, our self, protest against our selfishness. Protest against uh, the fact that we believe so many uh, other stories than the gospel too much of the time. And we fall into entitlement and demandingness. And, and we don't have eyes to see that, you know, everybody is made in the image of God. So catch each other doing it right. It's, it's not going to be like Darlene mentioned a Bowman and Mary's uh, glorious 100-pound golden retriever named Cooper. It's not like throwing your doggy a doggy bone. Good girl, good boy. Yeah, you know. It's not just reinforcing positive behavior. It's just flat encouraging each other. Catch each other doing right. Um, Honey, any of these you look at, do you want to jump in on? on um, look at this next one. Well, let me... Let me Mention this phrase we're in our last 12 minutes here, but this is good the, the encouragement is a discipline before it's a feeling Hold on to that You know some of you might be saying you don't know like right now I'm you know, I'm sitting though. I'm sitting next to him. I feel about 14 miles apart I don't feel very encouraged. Well Encouragement is a discipline you just do the next gospel thing you do the next right thing feelings follow and uh, it's just always flowing out of us. Oh, yeah. I think Darlene is highlighting now something that I would love her to speak to. So you don't, I don't know how many of the notes you'll have, but just a little section on forgiveness. Darlene's going to maybe kind of shift us there. If, if you have the notes, there's a lot of other practical things. But, yes, sweetheart, please, why don't you talk about um, the dailiness of forgiveness and what it is, what it isn't, just any, any word you would like to go with that. Um. A new revelation for me this past year um, has to do with I realized I would not pray as much for people if I was holding on to a grudge and, and if I was not forgiving someone and that goes back to my journal writing and entries of where we know I mean from the Lord's Prayer right Jesus taught his disciples, and we say it, maybe you say it every Sunday in your church. Father, forgive us as we forgive those um, who have sinned against us. And that's such a powerful statement. And throughout the gospel, over and over, love one another, forgive one another. So it, it helps me take out the trash often when oftenly um, with the grudges with um, holding on so if I go hmm I'm not really praying for Sky that much I know he's doing just fine he'll, he'll be okay or I'm not praying for my children or um, um, ducking behind um, some hanging clothes in a store because someone comes in the store who I'm like oh um, I'm still holding on to a grudge. So for me, the discipline of saying, Lord, I'm hurt, I'm angry, I'm committing this hurt and this anger to you. I'm forgiving this person. Cleanse me. Fill me with your love and your forgiveness. And then that, um, I mean, we know that's what God wants for us because I think it's been said that Unforgiveness is the poison that you drink. Hoping someone else will die. Yeah, hoping someone else will die. And it's very toxic. And so I know that I really believe that with forgiveness being so illustrated, which of course we know that's why Jesus came, right? To reconcile us to God, to forgive us of our sins. And he also says that we are to continue that ministry of reconciliation with others. Which, again, what could be more central to a culture of encouragement and kindness than that, that commitment to forgive? And, and that's going to mean uh, learning how to 
move towards one another to give each other feedback lovingly and receive feedback non-defensively, which is pretty profound in a marriage when that can happen. Let me say that again. A, a mark of grace breaking into our relational identity is when we are really seeking to give feedback lovingly and seeking to receive feedback non-defensively. To me, that's almost a sign of revival. You look at a marriage, a friendship, a group of elders serving at a church. I mean, anywhere we can speak freely and we can receive feedback non-defensively. Defensiveness just absolutely is one of the most uh, powerful toxins in robbing intimacy in a relationship. See, and here's where the gospel fits in. If, if Jesus really is my righteousness, I don't need to build a record before your eyes. I don't really have to defend myself. And, and what Darlene and I needed to do through some good counselors, we had some, we, we've, we've had the benefit of some great counseling and really learning how to communicate, learn how to conflict redemptively. But you still have to practice those skills even after you learn them. You want to come back to the skills. Some of you may be moving forward need to say, who can really teach us about what fighting fair can actually look like? What an odd phrase. And we grew up in a Christian subculture that, that was full of shoulds. Um, Christians really don't fight. They just have disagreements. And no, we really do fight. And we can either fight ugly or we can fight shaped by grace. Conflict is inevitable. Good conflict is not inevitable. And, and it's so good now to finally say, we can talk about, about anything now because we've developed the skill set and the heartbeat is not who's going to win, but what will God's grace breaking into this situation look like, you know? And some of those are big situations, but it's just a proactive orientation. Let me mention a few more here as we're winding down, because these are just, you know, these are not exhaustive and they're not anything by which we earn, but think about these disciplines. Um, um, recognize the roaches. Recognize, well, now let me go before that. Identify the names and labels you have tattooed each other with. The gospel is powerful enough to erase those tattoos. Compare what Jesus says about your spouse with what you say. And that's just an invitation to say, in terms of culture, kindness, and encouragement, be aware of where your mind goes when you look at your spouse and think about your spouse. Now, in the most exaggerated worst sense, um, you know, you can think about sometimes a culture's sitcoms give us kind of a mirror to say, hopefully we're not like that. But, and, and I'm not going to go to any particular sitcom right now, but uh, just think about the cartoonish language, you know, when, when, some, when a man refers to his wife as, uh, is either user-friendly or the old battle axe. Uh, now, that might be even kinder versions of what comes to mind, but the point is this. The Bible says there's the power of life and death in the tongue. I don't know if whoever first said, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That wasn't the Scripture speaking. And, and, and see, it's not even just what you say to your spouse or friends. It's what you say to yourself about them. Where have you unwittingly put your spouse in a cage that at best, you know, they might contradict for a moment, but you know, no, she is so, he is so. And, 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 and grace will invite you, first of all, to see yourself, and I'm so glad Darlene mentioned forgiveness, because the, the culture of forgiveness will lead us to believe in our hearts the log in my eye is always more of an issue than the speck in your eye. And if I believe that humility is going to be in this relationship, um, and, 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 and you, you, know, you can deal with almost anything from the posture of humility and a willingness to really seek as far as it's within your power, peace and a good resolve. All of that flows out of God's grace towards us. If I'm living with a greater awareness of how much the Father loves us, then there's the nourishment and supply we need to, to do this, to, to be aware of, you know, Lord, Lord, forgive me for just in my mind labeling, tattooing. A tattoo is kind of hard to get rid of, right? And only the gospel is powerful enough to erase some of those tattoos. But a couple more just positives. Um, uh, 
let's see here. Reco yeah, recognize the roaches and robbers that have come into your marriage. And that simply means this. What did you get used to you were never supposed to get used to? That you're not even aware of it anymore. If you, you, you've been in certain homes sometimes or seen that couple walking through the mall that, uh, that you're thinking, oh God, please don't let us become that. And, and they're loud and they're tacky and he's walking 15 feet in front of her. And you know, it's like, oh my word. Are they not even aware of how toxic their relationship is? And the truth is, they're probably not. Now, where do I know that? Okay, let's say at the end of today's worship service, you go home and you go through your front door and you go immediately into your home where you live with your spouse. And uh, right there in the middle of the kitchen, there are 17 brown recluse spiders, 12 tarantulas, and, and, a, and a couple of, of uh, pythons curled up. You probably are going to take action. You're not going to get used to them, right? You're not going to say, oh, it's okay. We can learn to walk around those. Some of you have poisonous snakes in your relationship that you need to say, how did it come to this where we got so used to being um, you know, judgmental, critical, etc.? And I just want to encourage you, if that's who you are, you're so welcome in this church. I want you to know right now, some of you are thinking, okay, did someone tip him off about us? No, we've been living together for 46 years. <laughs> and, and none of us in this room are beyond the need of God's grace and none of us are beyond the reach of God's grace. And, and, and I, I want to encourage all of you. The Lord will meet you where you are. Again, we were 25 years into our marriage as a senior pastor of a huge church. As a patient wife that had been moving into her own story of brokenness and disconnect, started moving more realistically into the love of God, praying for me, wooing, walking with me, until indeed the Lord brought me to a greater self-awareness of the fact that I'm an insecure man, successful in my world, but shaped more by shame and fear than anybody else knows. And God just has been melting our hearts and God's been helping us be far more encouraging, not looking to each other as though Darling could be my savior or I could be her savior or our kids could be our savior. They can't, it's the only one. So we are seeking proactively build more emotional cash in the relationship when, when withdrawals are gonna be made. You know, if you are building into the relationship, then when there's difficult stretches, you got something to draw on. If you're proactively saying, let's play together, let's find things we enjoy doing together. Um, we're seeking to do, you know, be more aware of that. Um, overlook as much as you can without falling into denial or reinforcing foolishness. Uh, that's just a discipline. The book of Proverbs talks about commending, you know, uh, overlooking. Now, not, um, not overlooking things that need to be called out, voiced, and owned. But this is just a pattern. You know, do you find yourself just getting more irritated than intrigue with your spouse. The gospel will ramp up your intrigue and ramp down your irritation. We are legally out of time here. Uh, I just want to wrap up. I'm going to have Darlene pray for us as we conclude. We're going to hang around here a little bit, but then I'm looking forward to having you pray for me as I preach uh, this morning in our combined worship service. But uh, again, go away today, I pray. If you were involved this weekend with us, um, do not in any level assume you're unlike any other couple in this church, a bigger mess or beyond hope. There is grace for all of you, every age and stage. So be encouraged. The gospel is true. It's mighty. It's powerful. And let's just walk in a culture of encouragement and kindness together until Jesus comes back to finish making all things new. Honey, would you pray for us? Father God, we come together here this day to look to you as your children and you as our Heavenly Father who loves us beyond our imagining and who gave his Son for us. And Jesus, we thank you so much that you live to intercede for us daily and that you have done for us what we cannot do for ourselves and that you said it is finished that we have restored relationship with you, forgiveness from you. And Lord, that you have brought us together to love one another 
And we cannot do that in our own strength and our own power. So we ask you, Lord, to fill us with your love and your mercy and your kindness. Help us continue to have our gaze fixed on you, looking to you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, I pray your comfort for each one here as it's Mother's Day and there are mothers who are no longer here and who are with you in their hearts who miss them. There are hearts who are confused about the mothers they did have and who are hurting. And we pray that you will heal those hearts. And we thank you so much in Jesus' name. Thank you, Mitchell and Bob. It's a great honor to be in this pulpit this morning, this city, and with some friends that predate certainly our coming into your community this weekend. Um, praying about just a good text that would be a wonderful portion of the Scripture to marinate in on this particular day I'm led to this remarkable picture in one of the Old Testament prophets that is not often read. Uh, if you have a Bible, if you have something electronic and you would like to follow the passage I will now read, you would turn to the little prophet of Zephaniah. And if you're making your way there or not, let me just give you a little background before I read our passage this morning. First of all, this morning, of course, the obvious is it's Mother's Day. And like Father's Day and a lot of other days that mark our family systems, days like this stir within us longings, memory, uh, hurt, pain, uh, celebration, consternation, pretty much the broadest continuum of relational feelings within our heart, as it should be. But then also this weekend that it just happened to work out for us to be Friday night and Saturday morning with so many wonderful couples, the same thing comes into focus. God made us for relationship. God made us for deep connection and intimacy, passion and delight, creativity, moving forward in life. And yet no one aspect of our human experience holds more potential for both beauty and brokenness than the way we do life relationally. That's why this morning we're going to focus on this theme, the only love that is better than life, the only love that will never let go of us, the only love that ever was or ever will be enough. And the premise this morning is not just one that comes to us from a prophet who was a vehicle of renewal and reform in Israel's story, but from Genesis through Revelation, this is the bottom line. This is the sum and substance of what the triune God who made us has willed for us. It is to come alive to his love. It is to know his love. It's to realize that even the best human relationship is meant to be a hint, whisper, and a vehicle of this very love. We are as human, we are as alive as we are believing and enjoying and growing in God's great love for us, and then extending it in all of these relationships. Well, hear the Word of God, and just ever so briefly as I read from Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, I only mentioned in passing that he is one of the prophets that God uniquely used leading up to one of the wonderful reforms, one of the few reforms in Israel's history. Maybe some of you remember one of the good kings in Israel. His name was Josiah. And like so many ways in which God tells his story, God had a story to tell through an unlikely king. Josiah legally was made king when he was eight years old. He did not take the responsibility of the nation until later, but our God loves to highlight it's through weak things, it's through unlikely things that he does his deepest, most enduring and endearing work. Well, in time, 
a reform broke out under Josiah when the scripture was discovered by the high priest in the temple. The very word of God had been lost to the people of God. And the scripture was found, but before that, this prophet Zephaniah spoke words from our God for 20 years leading up to the day when the Lord by his spirit would renew his people. And one image I would give you that kind of connects us this morning with this great love is during Zephaniah the prophet's day, it could, be well, it could be well argued that the people of God had become Cinderella with amnesia. Have that image in your mind? Remember the great story of Cinderella, a unlikely story of rejection and betrayal leads to a most wonderful connection in romance. Well, if you're Cinderella with amnesia, you forget whose you are and who you are. And unfortunately, the people of God forgot their story, forgot their God, continued to be very religious, but went on having lost the wonder, the awe, the astonishment of this great love. How great is this love? Hear God speak to his people, calling them to repentance and rejoicing of how he loves us. Zephaniah 3, beginning at verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He The Lord your God will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Let's just pray for one moment. Father, Son, and Spirit, in these next 15 or 20 minutes, would you just bring the explosive wonder of this love to bear on our hearts. Lord, those of us for whom Mother's Day is a hard day, Those of us, Lord, for whom a weekend of conversation about marriage stirred up longings and hurt and pain and and great gratitude. Oh God, whoever we are, in whatever season and how many contexts of relationship, would you give us faith to believe that this is exactly how you love us in and through the work of your son, Jesus Christ. Would you come this very Sunday before Pentecost Sunday, and by your Spirit, renew us, refresh us, free us from thinking that our children or our parents, our friends, our spouse, that free us from thinking that any human being could ever love us that would fill the void that is made by you and for you. Come, we pray and restore to us the joy of your salvation for us and in us, that it might run through us to our neighbors and the very nations of the world, praying together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wish we had a good longer season to to literally marinate in this text, but I'm excited about the Mother's Day lunch that a lot of you are going to have. So I will not let that pot roast get dry. So let's, let's just take our focus on this scripture and dare to believe that this is exactly how God wants us to know him. If you were to read the verses leading up to Zephaniah 3.14, you would be shocked at the contrast that our passage gives us. Because like all of God's good prophets, they offered a very important diagnosis before they delivered God's provision and cure. And from Zephaniah chapter 1, 1, all the way up to our text, the Lord is confronting his people. Like I said, they've been living like Cinderella with amnesia. God called us as his people to be a light to the nations, to be those that would say, this is what the God that made this world is like. 
This is his covenant love. This is his design, not just for one nation, but for every nation. They were made to be a light to the community, but they really lived more like a blight to the community. They were no different. Again, the passion, the heart of what it means to be in relationship with this God was lost, lost to idols of the culture. Mitchell used that phrase a couple of times today. We are all worshipers. It's not an issue of becoming a worshiper. Something or someone is the defining treasure and trust of our existence. You cannot be alive and not determine something that matters to you more than anything else. That is your heart's treasure. And where our treasure is, there is the rest of our life. We trust what we treasure. God's people have started trusting in a lot of other things than the God who wants to be known like this. So the Lord thunders in judgment, not to shame, but to bring to what I would call gospel sanity. We forget the truth. We get disconnected. Lies in us, lies all around us. Well, the Lord did his work, and then, again, through the glorious gift of his bringing humility and brokenness. And please know that the God of the Bible is in not to broken downness, but brokenness. Brokenness in Scripture is an image of coming to the end of yourself, really crying uncle that you might cry Abba, being in a situation where the right diagnosis would be brought to bear, even though it's, a, it's an unfavorable one, because the Lord means to heal restore and refresh. And he can be this gracious because of what we, look, what we find in this text. And let's just move in to some of these rich images. Notice what God commands in verse 14. And, and this is just as much a command as the command, do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery. Look at this command. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. Now think with me for a moment. When in your 16 years, 8 years, or 92 years do you remember that kind of whole person joy? I mean, don't you love the image? God commanding that we who deserve his judgment would actually come to a place of shifting within our inner being that can only be defined as whole person joy. Now, I, I, I wish we were at your Mother's Day lunch, and we could go around the table and ask this question. So when have you been that alive? Oftentimes when I preach this text, it's in a retreat setting, and, and, and sometimes I'll hear these responses. When have I felt this kind of joy at, at the birth of my first child, says the husband as he watches his wife bring that baby into the world. Sometimes it's, you know, for, for me, one of my greatest whole person joys was watching my son Scott bring in an eight and a quarter pound rainbow trout, a trout that he fought so hard that he intended to release as soon as he landed it, which is the sheer joy I had in watching my son catch that huge fish. It was just, it was just incredible. The, the day I got married was one of those days. The day Darlene said yes. In fact, I was so insecure. I did so much back work even before I would ask her out for a date to remove any possibility I would hear a no. When she said yes, it was an amazing day. I don't know what your day is. Another day I had a whole person joy. This doesn't sound very overly spiritual, but it was when I got to see Sir Paul McCartney, one of the Beatles, first perform the Beatles catalog. It was on the Tripping the Light Fantastic Tour in the Atlanta Omni, and he came out on stage, and it was like I was a 13-year-old little girl in Shea Stadium when the Beatles first performed. <laughs> it was like, it's a Beatle, it's a Beatle, which is the soundtrack of my life. When have you been set free beyond the four letters of your Myers-Briggs profile? Whether you're an introvert or extrovert, when have you been this alive to joy. God is saying rejoice with all your heart. Well, notice what the text says. There's a basis for this joy. God is not trying to jerk us around emotionally. Our calling as a people of God is not to one gigantic kind of group hug and fire ourselves up about God. There is a basis for joy or its manipulation. There's a basis of joy, core joy, or it's not long-lasting. Notice what the text says. Verse 15, and, and here's where we would begin to say, like all Scripture, it's going it's to always point us towards Jesus. All Scripture 
inevitably is going to lead us to Jesus. It's why Jesus, after his resurrection, was walking with a group of men on the road to Emmaus, and after walking with them, and finally, in his kindness, making sure they knew that it was actually him, the resurrected Jesus, in their company, the text says, as Luke records it, and beginning with the law and the prophets and the Psalms, he showed them all things concerning himself. All of the Bible inevitably, eventually, puts our gaze on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. How so in this text? Look at verse 15. We're commanded unto incredible joy, whole person joy. Why? The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. So immediately, God wants his people in King Josiah's day to know that he, the judge, has done something on their behalf that will be an occasion of incredible joy, not just in the moment, but for a lifetime and for the benefit of their neighbors. Now, we know this scripture would require the fulfillment of the great promises of the prophets because as Christians, we've already celebrated it in this room today. Where do we look to answer the question, where has God taken away our punishment? What word comes to mind? And you can speak it out. Where, where do we look to say with certainty, God has taken away the judgment we deserve? Where, where, do, where do we look? You're so polite. Of course, to Jesus, to the cross. We, we, we look into the story. We, we see an unfolding story from Genesis to Revelation that gains momentum even as the promises get bigger. And, and so here today, we want to begin thinking about this afresh. At the beginning of our week, what has God done? The God who made us, created this world, the, the God who wants us to know he contradicts so many wrong ways we think about him. What has he done for us? What is this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? When Jesus came into this world, we realize, not to be primarily our model to follow, but our substitute to trust. I didn't get that growing up in the church I grew up in. Grew up in a kind-hearted, good little community Presbyterian church in Graham, North Carolina. That's not where Billy is from or where they make crackers. It's a little city between Greensboro, where my wife is from, and Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I went to undergraduate school. And, I, 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 you know, I, for some reason, and I'm not blaming anybody, but I, I kind of thought Christianity was go look at the way Jesus lived and, and try to do that, and maybe at the end of your life, God will be pleased with what you did with that brief 15 moments in the spotlight. That is not the good news of Jesus. Oh, indeed, we follow him. But he is our substitute. He did something for us that we could never do for ourselves. And what does the scripture say Jesus actually did? Well, before he died for us, he did something revolutionary, revolutionary for 33 years. He lived in our place. Jesus actually came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And so as surely as we had a bad representative in the Garden of Eden, the first Adam, so God gave us a perfect representative in life, the Messiah, the promised Messiah, who would come to do for us what needed to be done. Jesus obeyed the law of God perfectly for all who know him. And then he died upon the cross, exhausting the judgment that not just those in Zephaniah's day, but today in this room, what we deserve. And it's not that God is just this amazingly angry God like the pagan deities who just has to satisfy something about him that we would know is unhinged wrath. This is the perfectly holy, loving God who loves so much he will take judgment to himself that he might have his family to love like this. Again, for the benefit of our neighbors, which we'll see before Bob offers the benediction today. So let's look further at the text. We, we want to be thinking about, okay, well, what does it mean when we 
Think about Jesus coming and, and taking judgment for us, but before that, uh, living for us and, and, and fulfilling the demands of the law. And, and, and what does that mean? Well, we move now from this text in terms of seeing how, how our God has done something immeasurable for us. Now we look at how now God is someone inconceivable towards us. And for the remaining moments I have, I just want to dare our hearts to believe that God through Christ loves like this right now, and there's nothing you can do about it, but believe it and come alive to it. You cannot add to it. You cannot take away from it. And there's, it's the most transforming, healing, liberating power in the history of mankind. Because God has done for us in Christ what he has done, notice by his own word how he relates to all of us, the, the, the youngest believer to the oldest, the most mature believer to the most immature. Let these images sink in. The Lord, the King of Israel is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, don't fear, O Zion, don't let your hangs hands hang limp. The Lord is with you. He's mighty to save. Now, look at these three phrases that I will uh, seek to present to my own heart and yours in these final moments together. Based on what God has done for us that's immeasurable, taking our judgment, giving, the gift, giving us the gift of righteousness. Here, here's, here's what God thinks about you right now. He would take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now, just, just, let's just go very slow here, though our moments are few. Do you hear what God is saying to you and to me based on what he did for us? Our God will greatly delight in us. Now, when in life have you ever experienced being delighted in, not even greatly delighted in? And here's what that would mean. What relationship in life, in this highly relational weekend, where would you grab a name that you could say, I've had a taste of this? Who has given you delight and enjoyment, not based upon anything you did or promised or fixed? You know, we grow up in a world where academics, athletics, physical presence, Everything that we're about is tied to performance, right? Some of you knew coming home with the, the report card and, and, and you got a ride in the family convertible and an ice cream cone because good job, three A's and one B. Now let's work on that B the next time. Some of you young women scored the winning soccer goal and you felt so alive. You immediately looked at the, where your mom and dad were sitting because you knew the pride they would have. Academics. Now, I didn't bring many of those report cards home. In fact, my family system was so broken, I assigned my own dad's name to my report card, which actually served my purpose well. <laughs> I could not boast in grades righteousness. But you just think about life. Where, where, where have you been delighted in? And, and, and what part of you can even begin to think about, you know, the God that we worship and sing and, and, and who invites us here? He He's saying to you, this is what I want you to know is true. So you don't start looking to any human being for the very delight I designed you for and I alone can give. I had a grandmother, Ward, Granny Ward, who after my mom died and Mother's Day always stirs within my heart longings and pain, uh, my mom was killed in a head-on car crash right after she turned 38. I was just 11 years old. And the disconnect from my dad uh, and from until the, I was 50 and he was 81 when we finally reconciled through the pain and the loss of my mother 40 years earlier, I was just relationally adrift. But I had a grandmother, Grandmother Ward, my mom's mom, and any time I would go to her house, it was just this big grandmother embrace, those, that big, wonderful, beautiful grandmother chest that would pull me in, and I felt enjoyed, wanted, and desired. Now, where have you tasted that in life? And dare you believe that that's the way God welcomes you? Though a nursing mother 
would forget her children. I will never forget you, says your God. Greatly delight in you. Could it really be that through the person and the work of Jesus, the the amazing grace that our brother sang about over us, that this is what it's all about, not a second chance. God has left nothing to chance but all things to Christ. Could it be that that which we at times angrily demand from our children, from our parents, from our friends, from our spouse, that we were just foolish taking good longings, plugging them into people. Well, I must move on here. All these images are worthy of our saying, Lord, make this real. Would you by your spirit, Lord, restore to us, give to us the knowledge of your love for us, a God who greatly delights in us. He goes on to say, secondly, he will quiet you with his love. In the Hebrew, Martin Luther picked up when he was translating this text, Martin Luther wisely saw that in the Hebrew, this is a double entendre, meaning an intentional double meaning, and it means this, God saying to us, he is quiet in his love towards us, he's made his peace with us, and he will quiet us by his love. I became a Christian as a senior in high school in 1968 at a Billy Graham movie called The Restless Ones. I have been restless all my life. And so have you. And that's why Augustine said, Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts remain restless till they rest in you. Let me ask you, in life, through God or people, is your experience far more a sense of not being quieted by love but shut down by shame? This is the God that says, I meet you in your repentable parts of your story and the repairable parts of your story to quiet you with my love. Who but God can speak the sacred hush to your soul, looking you, knowing your story better than you do, your rebellion, your unbelief, how you have in your own perhaps honesty would say, I've wasted so much of my life. Who but this God could say, Shh, I know. I know. It's really worse than you think it is. And I love you with an everlasting love and with cords of tenderness and kindness, I have bound you to myself because of what I've done for you through Jesus. Last image, and we're going to pray. This third one, well, really all three of these have been a, a huge part of my growth. Um, shared this weekend with those on the retreat. I've, I've, I've done my most important growth in the gospel from age 50 moving forward. I hope that encourages some of you that are not even half that age yet, but I hope it also encourages some of you that would think, I'm just too old, I've been doing this too long. The Lord will meet you today where you are, revealing himself to be the God who delights in you, who quiets you with his love, and if you can believe it, will rejoice over you with singing. Now, my wife, and I'm going to come down here for the final image just to get here. Don't worry, honey, I'm not inviting you up here right now, so this is an unplanned homiletical moment. My wife knows I don't like surprises. And, uh, and yet she pulled one off on the 40th birthday. And, uh, and I thought, okay, it's going to be my 40th birthday. By the way, that was a long time ago. You know, my next birthday will be number 69 on Groundhog's Day Eve, February 1st. Don't send me a card. I'm not fishing. Okay, just putting it in context. So she blindfolds me on the eve of my 40th birthday. And I'm thinking, she knows me. She's not going to shock me. There'll be, you know probably a couple of friends from our church, a uh, few of our founding members, uh, you know, a couple of couples, good musicians, friends. It'll be quiet and nice. It'll be a nice Pittsburgh-style steak, chart on the outside, pink in the middle. It'll be safe. Well, we drive, and I've got the blindfold on, and we actually end up, I uh, soon realize, at a little cabin place. And we get out of the car, and I go in, and as soon as I walk in the room, I realize there are 50 people there from a lot of seasons of my life. 
and they're all there, and you know, I'm shocked. I'm an introvert with extroverted gifts, so okay, I'm here. What am I going to do? Saying, sweetheart, you know I don't like surprises. No, I stayed present, and I did okay till they brought out the cake. You know what happens when they bring out your birthday cake? It's got candles on it, and what do they do? They sing at you. They look at you and sing. And you know what? Here I'm standing in this moment, and I was not aware as a 40-year-old of the narrative in my heart called uh, childhood sexual abuse. I was not aware that I'd never grieve the loss of my mom. And I'm there, and I'm watching now people that I know love me try to make eye contact. And that's a hard thing to do with me because so much shame has defined my life. And they're singing at me, and I could not sustain the singing, so I started singing with them. Who sings with people your own happy birthday song? <laughs> people like me that think it's too good to be true. Our God in this text goes on to back up this text of the God who sings to his people, rejoices over his people. He ties it to a wedding image and the prophet Isaiah. In that great growing messianic body of the servant songs, God says, as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so I will rejoice in you. In this image of a, of a, of a, of a singing Savior, a rejoicing bridegroom, it is revealed eventually as the way the Lord Jesus loves his people. One final image of how this came home to my heart, then I will pray. When we first moved to Nashville, Tennessee, it was 1979, I was ordained at First Pres Winston-Salem, called to be youth pastor at First Pres Nashville. And it was like this, just a magnificent, beautiful sanctuary. In fact, the inside of our sanctuary at First Pres Nashville looked like a giant wedding cake. It was magnificent. And I was called to do my first wedding. And I was a youth pastor. And in those days, again, I've got pictures to prove it, you know, I used to perm my hair. Now, what that has to do with the sermon, nothing. But, you know, while we're being vulnerable, let's just get it out there, okay? So I'm a youth pastor. It's a Saturday night Nashville wedding, which means what? Everybody's dressed in tuxedos. It's all formal wear. I mean, it is Amy Vanderbilt on display. And I'm the new guy coming in, and, and, and I've done my work, got everything prepared, you know, gone through the rehearsal the night before. And... Uh, huge sanctuary so the groomsmen come in with me and we're standing and I think I'm down as typical like on the second step uh, groomsmen's beside me all of his guys um, bridesmaids start coming in all is well huge gigantic pipe organ I mean it is so awesome these mothers of the bride they're there everybody is Nashville proper Saturday night decked out then here's the moment back doors open the bride slips across and on her father's arm, and you know that moment. You've had that moment. You are planning that moment. Before long, some of you will be in that moment. I'm feeling good. Got my notes. Everything's good. All of a sudden, the groom starts running up the aisle. What do you do in the moment as new guy in on the staff, youth pastor, Saturday night, First Pres Nashville, you immediately think, I just lost my job. <laughs> Didn't go there long. What I did, hiked up my robe like this, ran up and grabbed him and pulled him back. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, do I make eye contact with the, bro with the moms? And I did. And you know what I saw? I saw tears. I saw a mother of a groom and a mother of a bride say, look how my son loves her. And in that moment, we just had this profound moment of, he can't even wait for the one that will be his bride. Friends, that was just a sweet taste of what this scripture is saying to us. Jesus loves you like that. He is the spouse you always wanted. He is the relational world in which all the good tastes of our family systems, of good friendship, of life in the body of Christ, it's meant to say, behold how our God loves us in Christ, that this Jesus would give up his life to make a most unlikely bride, his queen, his cherished one. Oh, that you and I, moving into 2018, 
with childlike wonder and faith, would take God at his word. Again, next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. And even begin to say, Spirit of the living God, stir our hearts afresh. Let us know your delight. Let us know the quieting power of your kindness that leads us to repentance and change and hope. And may, O oh Lord Jesus, your singing over us and the gospel be the song that frees us to live in love to your glory. The rest of that text shows the people of God moving out on the world where God rescues the lame and gathers his children. The more fully this precious church is to the love of God in Jesus, the only love better than life, you will be the best neighbors. It will be rumored in the city there is a people who are being transformed by the love of God. Behold how they love and serve our city. May it be, may it be, may it be. Let me pray for us. Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you that there is only one love better than life. We're not wrong to want to be enjoyed. We're not wrong to crave delight. We're not wrong to want to give it to others. But Lord, free us from our unbelief. Free us from underbelieving the gospel. Free us from, on a Mother's Day, a marriage weekend, looking to children, parents, anybody to be our righteousness and our delight. Oh, Lord God Almighty, free us, restore us, that truly we might live in love until the day our great bridegroom Jesus returns to finish making all things new. And together we cry out, hallelujah with a Savior. Hallelujah with a salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.